yes, uh, Caleb, it's the second day of our 16th annual conference of the AONEI. Welcome you all to this meeting. I request all members to join as soon as possible. Uh, how many are here at this moment? Uh, don't tell me. Uh, 23, 23, I last saw. So I think good to have uh, 24 people at the beginning. 24. Start the proceedings. And Kalev, you can take it from me. Take a mic. Um, so uh, thank you, everyone, for logging in. I, I hope uh, in some more time, uh, others will be uh, joining in once they finish with their... Uh, of course, five, 10 minutes. Yeah. So we'll uh, start off with this first session, which will be a panel discussion on esophageal cancer. Uh, I would uh, like to welcome our, our chairpersons. So uh, I'd like to welcome Dr. Kudu Shahmed. The sir has been a, a senior uh, EAT head and neck surgeon in Guwahati. And sir was also a form, former president of ENI. Mm -hmm. yes, sir, we'll welcome you, sir. And yeah. I would like to welcome Dr. Tashnim uh, uh, Rahman. Uh, she is the professor of head and neck Oncology at um, Biborua Cancer Institute. Welcome, ma'am. Uh, yeah. I think Dr. Mahamaya Singh was uh, stuck up with an, some, he some had some stuff. personal work actually. He yeah. Then I think uh, both of you can uh, take it forward, ma'am. Please, the okay. session is yours. It doesn't. Charging. It will be It will Yes, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Raman, please take. Yes. Notice. Yes. Uh, I will welcome you once again to the 16 virtual conference of the AONEI. Now we have a panel on cancer nasopharynx and the moderator is Dr. Sharbani Ghoslaskar. I think uh, Dr. Sharbani Ghoslaskar doesn't mean any introduction, but still I would like to take the privilege to introduce her very short, in, very short, very shortly. She is the professor of a Department of Radiation Oncology of Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai, and is associated with our head and neck DMG. Uh, she has a myriads of paper publication in uh, many uh, national and international peer reviewed journals. And her research work has been cited many thousand times, I think, in many uh, in known journals. And uh, she has also a substantial contribution to nasopharynx also, her paper on research works on nasopharynx. So I'd welcome you, Dr. Sarbani Ghosh, for the, to moderate this. Dr. Sarbani? Uh, thank you, Tashneen. And it's a pleasure to be back here again. Uh, it would have been much more fun to have met all of you in person. Yeah. But uh, considering the circumstances, this is also good enough. Uh, it's nice to see familiar faces seniors, colleagues, and friends. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking uh, uh, Vikas and the entire organizing committee of the AONEI uh, for this kind invitation. Hello, Dr. Hamid. Hello, Dr. Bhuya. Uh, uh, it's nice to be here. Uh, so let's get started because I think I have half an hour to do my job. Uh, so I'd like to start. Uh, So I hope you can see my slides. Yes, ma'am, please start. Okay. So I have a good mix of panelists and I'm happy to have a pathologist, radiologist, nuclear medicine specialist, radiation oncologist, a medical oncologist and two head and neck surgeons. So I uh, let's get started. All of us are aware of the fact that uh, nasopharyngeal cancers are a little different I don't see my, uh, yeah, okay. Are uh, different from the other head and neck cancers. And this is essentially because of the way or the kind of incidence that we see for this particular cancer. Of course, we also see a bimodal age distribution. The causation is different from the other head and neck cancers and essentially involves several vi vi uh, environmental, genetic, familial, and viral factors. Majority present in advanced stages due to overlapping symptoms with other upper aero digestive tracts. 
uh, symptoms and disease. Early lymphatic spread and notorious predilection for distant metastasis often accompanies this cancer. However, despite all this, what is a saving grace is of course the fact that the tumors in this region, especially in the endemic areas are thankfully radiochemosensitive, which also means that non-surgical treatments play a major role in the treatment of this cancer. I don't need to tell you about this particular map. In the Northeast, of course, we have the highest incidence of nasopharyngeal cancers when we look at our country. And the incidence, especially from the uh, Kohima registry is as high as certain parts of Southern China. Having said this, what I'd also like to bring to your notice is the fact that despite the Tata Memorial Center being a high incidence uh, or rather a, a center that sees a whole lot of head and neck cancers, we register annually about 9,000 to 12,000 cases of new head and neck cancer every year. But if you look at this data from 2016 or even earlier, what you do and will realize is that mesopharyngeal cancers of the head and neck cancers constitute only about 2% and of all cancers about 4.4%. So let's get started with the panel. The first case that I talk about is a 67-year-old gentleman from Manipur who had no con known comorbidities. He's a chronic smoker, no family history of cancer, no history of tuberculosis or any other significant comorbidities. He presented to us with a right neck swelling for the last two months, had some form of dysphagia, difficult to quantify, but he talked about a feeling of things getting stuck in the throat. There were no signs or symptoms suggestive of aspiration or no visual nasal or your auditory symptoms. At baseline on examination, he was found to have these nodes in the neck bilaterally. The Hopkins revealed a supple base of tongue, excessive gag. We couldn't see the larynx and hypopharynx too well, but there was pooling of saliva. And there was no mass seen in the nasopharynx or in the nasal cavity. The outside FNAC from the right cervical lymph node called it a metastatic poorly differentiated carcinoma. And this is where I'd like my pathology colleague to come in and tell us as to, and the surgeons also on the panel to tell us the need for thorough mucosal examination, the role of further markers or what it is that you would want to do further on the pathology the role of serum EVV titer estimations, and if we need to do further IHC on the material from the lymph node. So can I, I have the uh, pathologists and the surgeons on the panel to please come in here? Uh, can I take it from here? Yeah, please do. So uh, uh, patient coming to us with uh, metastatic uh, lymphadenopathy in the uh, in the neck, bilateral neck, and uh, and also uh, on the clinical examination that uh, that we have shown so far, there is no evidence of primary other than there is slight change of uh, slight difficulty in swallowing. So uh, definitely, uh, if uh, we try to identify the uh, site of primary first for this metastatic neck node, considering that it's not a lymphoma. So uh, for walk-up for a, a metastasis of unknown, unknown origin, but that, I, but that I would consider here uh, right now, I have, we'd have to go for a thorough mucosal examination that will uh, involve a pen endoscopy, uh, thorough examination of the nasal bilateral nasal cavity, nasopharynx, uh, oropharynx, and hypopharynx. And uh, if we are able to detect any primary here uh, from the nasopharynx or any other side, definitely would go for a biopsy. Uh, as far as the uh, Iberish or the EBV uh, uh, yeah, So Anupam, this question I'd like the pathologist to take. Uh, Dr. Anupam, uh, Dr. Yes, Anup sir. Das, is he there? I think he can has I not joined. Think he could, uh, okay, can then I please go ahead. Question? Yeah, please, can I please go ahead question? then. Can uh, I ask a yeah. question? Yes. Uh, why FNC? Why not biopsy in the upper yeah, so that's what, so we're coming to that. So just now he has come to us with an FNAC. So why that's why we want. 
for appendicitis. Appendicitis, absolutely no. They should go for biopsy. Uh, see, no, now when I think in the, in the practice setting, the first thing that is usually done when a patient presents with a lymph node in the neck is usually an FNAC. But okay. when you have done a mucosal examination and you don't find a primary, that is when you may want to do something further. Uh, will any of the panelists take this or correct me if I'm wrong? Would you do something different? Anupam, you were going to say uh, something about the... Prof. Yeah, uh, 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 the EBV testing or an HPV testing, uh, the other way, we, whatever we do it, might help us in directing us to the primary uh, EBV uh, DNA positive in the lymph node would guide us to a, a nasopharyngeal primary, whereas a HPV would probably guide us to an oropharyngeal uh, primary. So that uh, EVV examination of a lymph node is very important as uh, when we are not able to detect uh, the primary, at least mucosally. Um, so I guess what we do agree is that we would have to do definitely go because we just have an FNAC of a poorly differentiated carcinoma and nothing more. So there is definitely a need to do a thorough mucosal examination to look for a possible site of a primary in the upper aerodigestive tract. Considering the native residence of this patient, we would definitely first think about a nasopharyngeal cancer. And though his symptoms may be a little misleading because he was complaining of dysphagia, we would, of course, uh, Dr. Saikia, as you were saying correctly, need more than an FNAC because it would not be possible to do further pathologic studies on the FNAC. So yes, we will look at doing either a core biopsy or an FNAB from the lymph node. And on that, we may want to do, or rather we would definitely do an Eberish and a P16 IHC. I think this is the minimum that we would want to do. And if the pathologist is sure that this is not a lymphoma, but a carcinoma, we will be sure and we would want to do Eberish and P16 IHC to try and see whether we can perhaps look at what the primary is. And these are the recommendations even from the AGCC 8th edition. Now, role of uh, serum EBV titers, supposing the Eberish is positive, and uh, would you want to do serum EVV titers or want to do something more before you go ahead and look at serum EVV titers? Anybody on the panel can take this question. I'm rising EVV virus. Hello. Hello. Yes. Please go ahead, Rajan. Can you hear me, ma'am? Yeah, I can. And if, there, if there is a rise of EBB virus, patient being from uh, Manipur, having a neck node, our target of direction most probably will be, most probably first site of uh, primary will be uh, nasopharynx. So oh, in that wow. way, our EBB virus, rise in EBB virus will give us the location of primary and patient being from Manipur and having a neck nodes. So I'd like to go for EBB virus titer also. So how many of so, you would EBV. actually uh, actually do EBV titer estimation in your routine practice? Rubu, would you want to say something? Uh, Madam, uh, actually, it's not routinely done. It's not available in our centers. Of course, it will be uh, it will give us a direction towards our uh, diagnosis and further plan for treatment also. But unfortunately, it's not available with us. OK. So we do agree that I we do a thorough mucosal examination. We will do further IHC and immuno, uh, further immunohistochemistry on the lymph node biopsy material. So let's go on from here. So the next thing that would happen is, uh, uh, so uh, just a note on EBV. Of course, we know that in the endemic population, this is a ubiquitous uh, infection and this can actually form the basis for screening, especially in the high risk population. And of course, it is present in almost all cells in the primary and metastatic nasopharyngeal cancer. And it is also a function of the geographic location. It correlates with the tumor burden, remission and recurrence and quantification can be recommended even for follow-up and to predict outcomes of treatment and has been found in most endemic populations where it is done routinely as an independent biomarker to predict survival. 
Now I'd ask Dr. Sandeep Taparia actually because uh, and I see even Dr. Pratap actually. So would they comment about the further imaging that should we should undertake for this patient? So we've got an FNAC, we've moved on to doing a biopsy. And in the biopsy, we've seen that it is, I will come to the report of the biopsy, but at this stage, after we've done a mucosal examination and a biopsy, uh, <laughs> what would you, you advise regarding the imaging for this patient? Dr. Pratap, Dr. Uh, Sandeep? Yeah. yeah. Hello? Yes, please, we can hear yeah, you. Yeah, Recent uh, articles from uh, South Korea, they advise uh, for T1 and T2 disease. Advanced disease, you can do CT scan, but in T1 disease, hello? Yes. Uh, for yes. T1 and unknown primary, MRI is the choice. This okay. is because MRI has a better soft tissue resolution. You can see the symmetry of the both sides. Asymmetry is a sign of, basically, if you are getting a metastatic node, asymmetry is a sign of also malignancy. Mm -hmm. Almost 80 to 90 percent uh, sensitivity. Another sign is the mucosal white line. You can see whole mucosa all along the nasal fringe, roof, posterior wall, posterior wall, everything. If you see the breach of this mucosal line, then it's very suspicious for an early nasopharyngeal carcinoma. In that way, we can target biopsy for that particular area. This is targeted biopsy. So according to article, radiology article says MRI is the investigation for size, for early nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Okay. What about yeah. you, Dr. Sandeep? What would you recommend for a patient like this? Would you go ahead with only local anatomic imaging or would you suggest doing a PET CT? Uh, Ma'am, coming to this uh, case particularly, uh, the patient is having large lymph nodes, at least uh, uh, you said six into six centimeters. So it is at least an N2 node. Okay. So look, it is a locally advanced N2 node uh, disease. So since the incidence of uh, distant metastasis is comparatively relatively high uh, compared to the rest of the head and neck malignancies. So I think uh, this patient will benefit if uh, the patient goes for PET CT initially. Okay. So let's see what happened, what we did with this patient. Uh... Uh, so uh, we know that what happens in a case like this is that though we don't have any prospective clinical trials comparing PET-CT in the setting of a CUP, I'm not talking about nasopharyngeal cancer, but in the setting of a CUP, we know that the PET-CT scores because it helps in the detection of an unknown primary and the yield may be almost 44% as per this paper, but the general yield is around 15 to 30% more than a conventional workup. And if you were to put all these tests together, they actually are complementary and it would be about 59.6%. But mind you, this is data from the Western world where they're essentially looking for P16 positive tumors. Now, in this particular patient, what happened was we did a PET CCT because the mucosal examination did not reveal any primary in the upper aerodigestive tract. So we went ahead and did a PET CCT. And if you see here, and I'd like Dr. Taparia to actually pay attention to these so that he could also comment on these images. We found these very large lymph nodes typically located bilaterally, levels 1B and 2, and also extending to the posterior neck, especially on the left side. So there are level 5 nodes too, and also level 4 nodes in this patient. And they do not, and at least as far as the imaging is concerned, we don't seem to be seeing anything in the region to suggest a possible primary. And this is just to get a snapshot of what is happening at the highest level, at the level of the nasopharynx, somewhere at the oropharynx level, and then lower down in the neck at the level of the epiglottis and further lower down in the level of the larynx hypopharynx. So the PET CT showed no evidence of a primary, but there were multiple lymph nodes. There seemed to be some thickening at the bilateral AE folds, but difficult to understand whether this was just because of the large bulky lymph nodes, was, was there a primary? But definitely the nuclear medicine specialist felt that there is no focal abnormality to suggest a possible primary. 
So an EUA and DL scopy was done on this patient further and no lesion was detected. DNA, no obvious lesion. The FNAC, when looked at further, could not differentiate between a primary salivary gland carcinoma and metastatic carcinoma. It would have been very nice to have had a pathologist. And final biopsy report uh, was actually an undifferentiated metastatic squamous carcinoma. However, it was negative for EBV LMP1 with weak staining for P16, which was interpreted as negative. So the final diagnosis that was made in the joint clinic was a carcinoma of unknown primary with metastatic lymph nodes to bilateral neck. It was N3B because it was staged as a squamous. It was reported as a squamous carcinoma, but it was undifferentiated. Now, considering that this patient was from the Northeast, had an undifferentiated carcinoma, it was thought that we should be treating this patient like a nasopharyngeal cancer. So my question now to the panelists was that, is it correct to consider treating this patient like a primary in the nasopharynx with metastatic neck nodes bilaterally? Any comments on this? Anybody could take this question. Anupam, Rajyoti, Rubu. Um, we should Sumit. consider. Sumit. Sorry, I couldn't. Uh, I didn't. Uh, yeah, Sumit. Um, um, actually, there is there were no retropharyngeal lymph nodes. Yes. So only only oh, level sorry. level two and lower down lymph nodes. So had it had the patient had uh, retropharyngeal lymph node, then we would it would have been more in the favor of nasopharynx. But since okay. only level level two, level three, level four nodes are there. So it will, in this uh, kind of picture, it will be difficult, according to me, to just to label it as a nasopharynx. Okay, uh, I take this point because he doesn't have retropharyngeal nodes, despite having bilateral level two, level five, and level three and four also. A good point, actually, very good point. Anything else anybody would like to say? Again, Madam, we should, Madam, we should target all the mucosal surface in the head and neck, considering nasopharynx to be the first part. So that patient is coming from uh, Manipur with uh, bilateral neck nodes. So we should be uh, targeting the all head and neck regions along with the mucosal radio, uh, mucosal dose to the all mucosal regions in the head and neck. So what I think, Rajuti, you're uh, trying to say me. that... Yes. Can I, can I add something? You so yeah, surely. Uh, if you allow me. Yeah, so, yeah, please do. You're the chairperson. Is right. <laughs> LMP1 is expressed, you don't know, it's positive. No, it's negative, it's negative. Oh, it's, it's negative. negative. Sorry, it's sorry, sorry, sorry. It's negative. Ma'am, at this point of time, I will be apprehensive treating it like nasopharynx. Okay. And why, what is your apprehension about? Because EBV is negative and Sandeep has already mentioned, ma'am, the points. Okay, fine. So I take Take this point so there is a difference in opinion between what we chose to do versus what you would have happened because we thought this was nasopharyngeal cancer we of course would do this further follow-up but then what i would like to know from the panelists is even if you consider that this is not a nasopharyngeal primary what would be your plan of management would you do induction chemotherapy followed by ctrt ctrt followed by adjuvant chemotherapy neck dissection followed by ctrt so would you all uh, take it up? Uh, let's start with Sumit. Um, I will uh, first, uh, obviously I'll ask my radiation co co team colleagues okay, what is their exactly. opinion, what they will do. It. If they are okay, probably I will choose as induction only if the radiation team agrees, otherwise no. And what is it that you would like to know from your radiation oncologist? See whether they will be able to cover what is the volume of the disease, are they apprehensive about the toxicities, or they are apprehensive about the failure, given that uh, like the it is the bulky tumor, it is bilateral neck nodes. There's high chances if it is squamous cell, it may manifest during the course of the treatment, or it may appear uh, as a metastatic disease in the lungs. So okay. going directly for that, or to go for chemo chemotherapy, Personally, I will choose as induction chemotherapy definitely in this subject of patient. Okay, so this is Doctor. Uh, this is Sumit's opinion. Rubu, would you like to say anything different? Uh, uh in nasopharynx, ma'am, uh, the standard of uh, no. So Rubu, now we've changed RPG. gears. Uh, sorry, Rubu. Uh, the panel yes, as a whole, more or less, thinks that this is not nasopharynx, even if it uh, was not 
nasopharynx and we're thinking about this as an unknown primary with bilateral large bulky lymph nodes and an undifferentiated carcinoma, how would you want to approach it? Do a CTRT or do induction followed by CTRT? Because Sumit wants to ask your opinion mm -hmm. before considering induction chemotherapy. Uh, even in, in med, madam, uh, other head and neck cancers, CTRT will be our first preference. But uh, seeing okay. this, uh, the, the, the bulk is uh, of six centimeter node is there. Um, then we can consider induction chemotherapy also. But uh, in this case, I think uh, uh, by seeing the picture, the, it can be well covered in uh, uh, one radiation portal. So I like to okay. uh, take the patient for CTRT straight away. Okay, fine. What would you uh, do after? Would, yes, yes, uh, Anupa. Yeah, we would not consider neck dissection for this patient as as upfront. Uh, okay. Probably will go ahead with CTRT or induction chemotherapy, whatever the radiation and medical oncology chooses. And uh, uh, neck dissection can be kept as a salvage if in case of any failures. Okay, fine. So I guess most of the people on the panel feel that we would start with CTRT because the radiation oncologist feels that this can be encompassed properly. We would be able to deliver doses that are necessary. And then possibly depending upon the response, uh, Dr. Sandeep, correct me if I'm uh, wrong, that we would do a PET CT after about 12 weeks of completion of the CTRT and then decide what we would do next in this in this patient right yes madam M minimum 12 weeks okay uh, there is a question or a comment in the chat box okay uh, uh, okay very good caleb has given me some more time so we'll finish this particular case and we'll just stop it by saying that we agree to disagree we are considering this not as an unknown primary with possible meds in the nasopharynx but probably an undiagnosed primary as of now because we have a P16 negative status, we have an EBV negative status. Considering that perhaps even if it were the nasopharynx, we don't have really retropharyngeal nodes despite those large bilateral nodes. We are considering this as still an unknown primary with metastatic neck nodes. We will treat with CTRT. Because as Rubu said, we really, for non-nasopharyngeal cancers, we really do not have evidence supporting the use of induction chemotherapy. It is possible to treat adequately with radiotherapy. So we will do CTRT followed by, uh, followed by assessment of response at 12 weeks. And depending on the response, we will decide what is to be done next. If it is a CMR, we will do perhaps observation, we will observe. And if it is not a CMR and if there are residual lymph nodes, depending upon resectability, we will go ahead and do a neck dissection. Do you all agree with me? Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. fine. So now we will go to the next patient and, uh, sorry, uh, next case. And uh, okay, fine, we finish this. Case two actually is a 17-year-old boy who is a student. He has no comorbidities no past history of any significant illness. He presented with a left-sided neck swelling and left nasal obstruction for the last six months. On presentation, he had a conglomerate hard fixed nodal mass, which was about 10 into 10 centimeters. And essentially the entire left neck was involved. On examination for the local disease, no cranial nerve palsies were noted. An ultrasound had been done outside and it showed a 5.4 into 4.6 centimeter swelling in the left submandibular region, essentially because this node was very large and there were multiple necrotic lymph nodes in the neck. The biopsy outside was suggestive of perhaps a Hodgkin's disease. Now, when we did review the same biopsy here, it showed Kikuchi disease, which is essentially a necrotizing lymphadenitis. And since here we don't have the backup of a pathologist, we won't look at this anymore. The gene expert for mycobacterium tuberculosis was also negative. However, when we did an FNAC again, Dr. Saikia may get angry that we're doing a FNAC again, but uh, this had been done and this was a poorly differentiated malignant tumor. So my question actually was to the pathologist here that since we have all this material, what more would he or she have looked at for on the pathology? Uh, so, but then since I don't have a pathologist, I'll go on to give you the answer. 
So when they looked at this, there was an undifferentiated carcinoma. The IHC showed atypical cells which were positive for AE1, AE3, and focally positive for CD23, but negative again for P63 protein and EBV LMP1. The, unfortunately, what had happened was that we did do the EBV serum titers, but it was uninterpretable. And what it simply meant that we couldn't say whether this was positive or negative. And essentially, this was something to do with the DNA extract on the, in the serum. So now I would ask uh, the um, uh, radio diagnosis people, Dr. Pratap and Sandeep, to actually tell us that this is a person who has a mass in the nasopharynx. It is an undifferentiated carcinoma. And the patient has large bulky lymph nodes on the entire left neck. So Sandeep and Dr. Pratap, would you please go ahead and take it on from here? Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, there's a um, lot bulky nodal mass in the neck. So first you have to, it is a metastatic, no? undifferentiated metastatic carcinoma. Yes. So you have to see the primary, basically. So do a CT scan neck and thorax, I think. To see okay. the primary. Okay. Then, if you are suspecting lymphoma in the previous slide you have shown, then you have to do whole thing: neck, thorax, and abdomen to see the lymph nodes in other parts of the body. So, imaging wise, I think you to do a CT scan, neck and thorax. Uh, Doctor Pratap, I just want to know from you why is it that you're suggesting doing a CT scan of the neck, thorax, and abdomen, even if it were a lymphoma? Is it because of the restricted the availability of PET CT, or is it because uh, you think that these investigations would give us the same amount of information as a PET CCT? It's similar, but the resolution is better. You can uh, detect uh, this one, small node also in uh, uh, this one, CT scan and this one. So this basically to stage the disease if you're suspecting lymphoma. No, so, so now the US, pathologist is very clear. It's an undifferentiated, undifferentiated carcinoma. carcinoma. It so is not just, a... Uh, it's a squamous, no? Yeah. It's a squamous. So you, I think the first imaging modality is this ACT name. Okay. And the uh, thorax. So see the esophagus also. You see, this is uh, squamous cell carcinoma. Okay. Dr. Sandeep? So, madam, it will, like, it is a clinical decision. So it depends on the clinician, like uh, like what he, how confident is he and where he is suspecting the primary. Based on the geographical location, like where is the patient, uh, where, where is the patient from? Some suppose this patient is from Mumbai. So uh, clinician may not think that it is a nasopharyngeal primary. So whatever primary they think, but uh, since it is a bulky unilateral node, so clinically, I think the bulky unilateral large node, it is going against lymphoma because only one side node, not bilateral node, no axillary node. If the clinically no other nodes are there, so it is unlikely in the form of, form of lymphoma. But like uh, PET CT, it will give you advantage, like as you already mentioned that it, it has a, around 44% sensitivity of detecting the primary malignancy in a case of unknown primary. Okay. So what we so another think, thing, ma'am. Yeah. Yes. Yes. One report says there is a lesion in the region of the submandibular gland. So you have to do sit. one report. One USG report showed there is a lesion in the uh, right submandibular gland. So whether it is a primary or it is a nodal mass for that differentiation, actually you have to do CT also. Okay. It so could be a primary salivary gland neoplasm also. See, uh, the thing is what we decided to do here because of the kind of lymph nodes, uh, lymph node distribution, as well as because of the age and the histopathology of an undifferentiated carcinoma, we went ahead and did a PET CT, which showed a soft tissue mass involving the left aspect of the nasopharynx with these large retropharyngeal nodes. And as Dr. Sudhi, uh, Sumit had pointed out last time, there was a retropharyngeal lymph node also and the entire neck actually on the left side was involved, but there were no, there was no evidence of distant metastasis. And these are the images that we got on this patient. So you can appreciate the left-sided nasopharyngeal mass, which seems to be crossing the midline. And of course, there are the posteriorly located neck nodes also. And this is the uh, PET CECT, which also shows the large lymph nodes. And here I'd like to tell Dr. Pratap is perhaps this large level two lymph node 
encroaching yeah. upon the left uh, level 1b also and causing that mass effect at the uh, 1b level so this is definitely at least from the scans not looking like a primary in the salivary gland and looks more like the neck nodes itself we also did a primary um, uh, mri because we would always like to look at what the disease what the anatomical extent of the disease was and again, if uh, you could appreciate very well here that there is a mass in the left nasopharynx, which is not going intracranially, but of course there is a mass in the left nasopharynx. And as is often seen with nasopharyngeal cancers, especially the undifferentiated kind, there are large lymph nodes and the primary is relatively smaller in volume. So this is the kind of lymph node distribution that we had in this patient. This is the extent of the disease. And we had a T2, N3, N0 carcinoma of the nasopharynx. So again, my question to the clinicians here would be, Rubu, Sumit, and the uh, surgeon. Uh, the, yes. uh, madam, uh, yeah, can I take yeah. this question? Yes, please. <laughs> madam, uh, unlike the previous case, uh, here we can see a bulky primary as well as nodal. Yes. So the covering uh, this uh, region would be a little bit difficult. And we want to reduce toxicity as much as possible in this okay. young patient. That's why I'd like to consider for induction chemotherapy in this patient, then followed by CTRD. Okay, so Sumit, your radiation oncologist has told you that she is going to do induction chemotherapy, followed by a response assessment, I'm sure, Rubu, and then do yes, CTRD, definitely. right? Definitely. So what would be the choice of drugs in the induction regime, Sumit, and why? And that is a good question. Uh, here, definitely, given the kind of disease, the induction treatment is advisable. So if I have to choose an induction, the debate is definitely it's going to be cisplatin-based. But the thing yes. is, what next we choose with the cisplatin? Is it going to be gemcitabine or is it going to be docetaxel cisplatin? Okay. So here, since it was, again, a negative case, so we will use, I would be comfortable using the docetaxel cisplatin in 5-FU regime here in this patient okay. because he's relatively young. Likelihood of tolerance is likely to be good and uh, it will cover both the aspects also. So how many cycles would you do? Uh, usually, ma'am, uh, three cycles. If uh, there is response on two, probably yes, third cycle definitely I will give. But I will use the doses of uh, like 75, 75 and 1000 milligram per square meter probably, not the lesser one, not the 60 okay. one. Okay, fine. So you won't use the 660. Yes, okay, fine. So what? So typically, this is our algorithm that we follow. And as you've heard, both from Rubu as well as from Sumit, we would go the neoadjuvant way. And Sumit here would prefer doing the taxane-based chemotherapy with this platinum. Two cycles to begin with. And if the patient has a good response, we'll go on to doing the third cycle also. So, of course, today we have evidence for the use of induction chemotherapy, randomized trial, 241 patients. And of course, there is a later follow up which shows that there is a definite evidence and definite improvement, statistically significant improvement and uh, which favors the use of induction chemotherapy followed by concurrent chemo radiotherapy. These are graphs to show the same. At the same time, we also have evidence for the use of gemcitabine and cisplatinum. Yes, Sumit is correct in saying that perhaps we really do not know about the young or the young patients and the young adolescents. This is mostly data from the adult population. But yes, the other regime that has been considered in the induction space is gemcitabine plus cisplatinum followed by chemo radiotherapy. And of course, both have shown statistically the improved outcomes in favor of the induction regime. And this is our own experience at the TMH where we've used a, a taxane based regime and our outcomes are also favorable and comparable. But what we need to understand is that since a large proportion of our patients also have bulky entry disease, there is a very high chance of failure at distant sites. So this is something that we should all keep in mind. And I'm sure this is something that you all battle every day. So then what we did for this patient is we did consider giving induction chemotherapy, but we used the GEMSYS combination. There was partial response to the PET-CT that was done after completion of the chemotherapy. The primary extent of disease, there was a reduction with some reduction in the size of the lymph nodes, but there was 
still no distant metastasis. So post induction, this is the uh, picture, the PET CT, you can see some reduction in the uh, thing in the primary and of course also in the lymph nodes, there seems to be some reduction, though it is not a CMR, it is a PMR. We also did a MRI because of the large lymph node and also to be able to use this same thing for our radiotherapy planning. So now I will come back to the uh, to Rubu. So what would you like to do for this patient before you plan? Would you go ahead with your plan of NACT followed by CTRT or do you want to change anything? No, I would like to go. Um, okay. So what is the evaluation that you would want to do on these patients? Uh, when I like to do a, or his uh, oral examination and uh, um, routine examination or uh, and uh, yes, okay. definitely speech and swelling. So uh, Caleb is signaling to me that we should finish soon, but I would like to show you. I would finish with this case, Caleb, if you allow me. Sure, so what happened typically is that we did all this evaluation pre CTRT, and of course. Rubu, if you could quickly talk about the volumes of radiotherapy. Yes, madam. Uh, I'd like to give 70 gray to the gross disease and uh, that will include the primary and the uh, uh, node. And for high risk uh, uh, region, I'd like to give 54 to 60 gray. And for low risk, I'd like to consider as uh, 50 to 54 gray. Uh, yes, please go uh, ahead. And, and techni technique, uh, I'd like to use uh, IGRT. Uh, okay. and uh, uh -huh. uh, that is uh -huh. okay. So, I'm plus so, we would deliver definitely a 70 gray 35 fraction equivalent to the pre CT volumes, pre NACT volumes using IMRT techniques. And of course, we have guidelines today to tell us how to do it and uh, how much dose we should be giving. So, we give this, give this patient 60 gray 30 fractions. Patient concluded radiotherapy in December with six cycles of concurrent cisplatinum. Sumit may say that this dose of concurrent cisplatinum was lower, but this is what we were using in those days. And we have used 30 milligram per meter square. And these were the contours that we, uh, our contours that we did. And this is a kind of dose distribution. And this is the doses. Of course, there are guidelines as to how to prioritize and how to prescribe doses. And this is what we should be aiming for. And this is evidence to show that, of course, we should be treating our nasopharyngeal cancers with IMRT to be able to deliver with the right dose and also save the adjacent OARs. Now, what happened, unfortunately, for this young boy was that he presented at first follow-up with persistent pain in the lower back, radiating to bilateral lower limbs, and had a pain score of 7 by 10 with a residual left level 2 lymph node. And the PET CT done at that time was suggestive of progressive disease. And unfortunately, this is the kind of progression. The, naso, the neck had that residual node, but which had no avidity. The nasopharynx was clean, but he had disseminated uh, uh, distant metastasis. This is how it looked, multiple liver mets, multiple bone mets. And then patient presented with acute onset paraparesis and an urgent MRI showed the picture that I have already shown you. There was definite metastasis at these uh, lower, uh, lower lumbar vertebrae as well as multiple other bony sites. Now what? So Sumit, here I'd like you, you to button quickly and give, you, give us the answer in about one or two lines. Um, I would like to do the re-biopsy and definitely I would like to do the Eber test on the biopsy now. Okay. So what are you looking for in the biopsy? Basically, just still the suspicion is whether it is EBR positive or negative tumor, ma'am. Okay. So if it is EBR positive, then the likelihood of giving uh, extensive treatment is, uh, the chances of response are much higher as compared okay. to the uh, squamous cell. Okay, granted. So you would give chemotherapy, but after repeating a biopsy from at least one of the metastatic sites. And now, what kind of chemotherapy would you consider here? Again, ma'am, if it comes either positive, then probably gemcitabine I would like to use. Otherwise, Texade, and we have given already given NACT. Yes. So likelihood, the chances of responding to chemotherapy will be poor. So definitely, in this setting, we can proceed directly to IU agents. Okay. But uh, still, I would like to do the PDL one testing and okay. see. Okay, PDL one also. And second thing, if it is yeah. not nasopharyngeal, probably. The role of cetuximab, I would like to discuss, but otherwise I will keep it 
in the later lines now. Okay. And Rubo, would you consider giving any form of palliative radiotherapy? Yes, ma'am. Uh, he has painful bone disease, uh, bone metastasis, so definitely palliative care is the ruling. And, and of course, we would also do the renal functions and offer him bisphosphonates to take care of the diffuse and generalized bone metastasis, right? Both yes, Sumit and yes. uh, Rubu? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so could we have predicted this is my next question simply because we have this young boy with so much of nodal disease and what are the prognostic markers? So in, uh, for sake of time, I just like to allude to this slide saying that, of course, young patients are supposed to do better. But then if you have volume, like the volume that we saw in this young boy, they are at a higher likelihood of perhaps failing. And here the PET CT also has performed a very important function of being able to kind of prognosticate simply because the patient had a PMR to the NACT as well as to the CTRT that was given after the NACT. And not only that, perhaps if we had EBV titers, we may have been in retrospect wiser as to whether this patient had a chance of failing uh, soon or rather whether this patient would go on to have a complete response. So what we did to this patient was, of course, gave him some local therapy and medical decompressive measures were tried. And we are now the patient is still admitted and we will be referring him for an opinion about medical, uh, about uh, further chemotherapy. I just like to say that there are some nomograms available which may help us choose patients for concurrent chemo radiotherapy and induction chemotherapy. And of course, it would also help us choose and avoid unnecessary toxicity. This is, of course, the paper that showed that gemcitabine definitely has a role in recurrent or metastatic nasopharyngeal cancer. The paper, uh, the agent that Sumit um, said he may choose. And of course, this is just an algorithm showing if you have recurrent nasopharyngeal cancers, what could be your options at the end of the day? Uh, I would also like the audience, if there are a lot of students, to, research, to actually refer to the recent uh, updated um, ASCO and Chinese Society of Clinical Oncology uh, recommendations for the treatment of nasopharyngeal cancers from stage two to four A. This is pretty, uh, pretty um, extensive, but covers all aspects of the treatment quite well. And I thank all my panelists for their active participation and the organizers for the kind invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Sorry, uh, Caleb. I overshot. Thank you, thank you ma'am. Uh, we would uh, love to give you more time, but uh, because I, I can understand completely. It's okay. Yeah, thank thank you. you. Yeah, thanks to all the panelists and thank you, Dr. Laskar. Thank you. For welcome. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, to thank the you. chairpersons, Dr. Tashnin and uh, Dr. Kudu Shamit. Uh, actually, there is a change. We are supposed to have a panel discussion uh, by Dr. Ravi Kannan, but Unfortunately, uh, he is held up. He is traveling, and he is not unable. He is unable to log in uh, right right away. So we will have it after some time. Dr. Sian Paul has been very kind enough to do his talk now. Uh, so he will do that talk alone uh, right right away. So uh, Dr. Sian, uh, can you are you ready? Uh, can yes. can the presentation of Dr. Sian Paul be, uh, please be loaded? Yeah, I am trying to share my screen. Yeah. Uh... I don't know, uh, I think, why I can't share my screen. Yeah, so can you share mind. the screen? I mean, uh, share my presentation? Yeah, they are sharing his, uh, your, your yeah, slide. Sure. Yeah. So thank okay, you. Uh, just one minute, uh, Dr. Sain. Uh, I wanted to introduce Dr. Sain Paul. Uh, he is a senior consultant in radiation and oncology at Apollo Hospitals in Kolkata. He's, he also passed out from Tata Memorial, and we are yeah, glad to have him here. Please uh, go on, Dr. Sain. He's... Uh, good evening and thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, at the outset, I want to thank the Northeast Association of Oncologists for giving me this opportunity and my dear friend, uh, Dr. Bikas Jagtap. So actually, Dr. Bikas and I, we are batchmates. We are together in Tata Memorial Hospital. So today's topic is radiotherapy in small cell cancer, recent updates. So this is uh, quite, an inter quite an interesting topic because we keep on talking about the non-small cell lung cancer a lot, but we don't talk that much about the no, uh, about the small cell lung cancer. So in 2020, we got two updated guidelines. One is from ASTRO, that is the clinical practice guide, guideline. Another is from ISTRO, that is for the uh, that is for uh, uh, the radiotherapy planning guideline or contouring guideline. 
Yes, because this is a multidisciplinary meeting, so I'll stick to the clinical practice uh, part of this talk because otherwise you might, might not feel it that much interesting. So next slide, please. So before going to the main topic, uh, let me recapitulate the management of small cell lung cancer. As we all know, so it's uh, it's limited stage and extensive stage. We have a small cohort of patients who are very early disease like T1, T2, N0, though it is rarely detected in our setting. So other than that, uh, uh, stage small cell lung cancer treatment is actually chemotherapy uh, for two six cycles with local radiotherapy, which is usually concurrent radiotherapy followed by prophylactic cranial uh, irradiation if it is not progressing. And for extensive stage lung disease, it is four to four, six cycles of chemotherapy. And then in some cases, consolidative radiotherapy to the thorax, which is uh, usually sequential, and then uh, prophylactic cranial irradiation as and when needed. Next slide, please. So what is the aim of this talk? Uh, there are actually few indications of radiotherapy in small cell lung cancer. First one is obviously in limited stage uh, small cell lung cancer. So we'll discuss uh, who, uh, when to use the thoracic radiotherapy in limited stage small cancer, what is the dose fractionation and how to sequence it with chemotherapy. Another, there is a small cohort of patients who might be benefited by SBRT and post-op radiotherapy. We'll try to find out whether what is the role of SBRT and post-op radiotherapy in this cohort of patients. And obviously there is another group that is extensive stage small cell lung cancer, whether they will be benefited with thoracic radiotherapy and then how. And lastly, a prophylactic cranial irradiation in both the scenarios. Next slide, please. So first one is thoracic radiotherapy for limited stage small cell lung cancer. Next. So as we all know that thoracic radiotherapy for limited stage small cell lung cancer is an well-established uh, modality. And as early as 1992, we got this final meta-analysis, which, uh, is, uh, which uh, actually uh, it's a meta-analysis of 2,140 patients of 13 randomized control trials with uh, 43 months of median follow-up, and which clearly shows that chemotherapy versus chemotherapy plus lo local radiotherapy, the, it improves the survival, the 14% reduction in death rate, and absolute three-year overall survival is 5.4%. So we are all using thoracic radiotherapy for limited stage small uh, cell lung cancer. Next. So there is a CR data analysis also, which shows that the survival of limited stage small cell lung cancer has improved over time. And largely because people are now using radiotherapy along with chemotherapy. So using radiotherapy has substantially improved the survival of small cell lung cancer. Next one, please. So what is the recommended dose and fractionation? For limited stage curative radiotherapy recommended is 45 gray in 30 fraction, 1.5 gray BID dose. That is twice daily, over three weeks of time. We use hyperfractionation. Why hyperfractionation? Because as we all know that small cell lung cancer has a high growth fraction and it's a short cell cycle time and it has small or absent shoulder in the cell survival curve. Those who are radiation oncologists can understand this very well. And it also reduces the late toxicity and it counteracts accelerated repopulation. So small cell lung cancer is actually ideal neoplasm for hyperfractionation. And why only 45 grade? Because it's a very radioresponsive disease. Usually it requires less radiation dose. 45 grade daily fractionation conventional is 70%, 5% of interthoracic relapse. Intensification is needed. So maximum tolerated dose with conventional is 45 to 51 gray BID fractionation and 70 gray if we are using daily fractionation. Next slide. <clears throat> so there was an intergroup trial published in 1999 by Turisi et al, which uh, clearly shows that there is a survival benefit and improved local regional control when we use twice daily fractionation, that is hyperfractionation, compared to once daily thoracic radiotherapy. And the uh, overall survival improved significantly, 26% versus 16%. And there was a little bit of increased grade three acute esophagitis, but no other different, uh, no difference in lead toxicity. Next one, please. 
so is there any acceptable alternative option because sometimes we find it quite difficult to give twice a daily dose because of different logistic issues so patient choice and departmental logistic based on that 60 to 70 gray and 2 gray per fraction over 6 to 7 weeks that is conventional fractionation which is more than 50 gray is often used so do we have the data to say that it is equivalent there was a trial called convert trial which was published in lancet in 2017 which is an open level phase 3 randomized trial which compared concurrent once daily versus twice daily radi uh, chemo radiotherapy for limited stage small cell lung cancer and which shows there is uh, actually there is no survival difference between 66 day 33 fraction and 45 day in 30 fraction but the problem is this was a superiority trial and it was not powered to show equivalent so if someone asked that do we have a head to head comparison uh, we might say that no we don't have that but uh, to uh, you need, need to accept this most of the centers also now use once daily fractionation because of logistic issues so next slide please So what is the timing of thoracic RT? Because we need a little bit of coordination with our medical oncology colleagues regarding the thoracic RT. Next slide. There has been studies. So this one is a Japan Clinical Oncology Group trial published in 2002. And this study strongly suggests that the cisplatin plus cytoposide and concurrent radiotherapy is more effective for treatment of limited stage SCLC than sequential radiotherapy. So they have advocated that radiotherapy should be used concurrently with chemotherapy, not after completion of the chemotherapy. And there is clear cut benefit. Next one, please. In 2004, there is another landmark trial, uh, systematic review, and uh, was published uh, about the timing of thoracic radiotherapy as a combined modality treatment. So it concluded that there is a small but significant improvement in two-year overall survival for early radiotherapy versus late radiotherapy in limited stage small cell lung cancer, similar to benefit of adding RT to chemotherapy or prophylactic cranial radiation. So if we use radiotherapy early in the chemotherapy cycles, so it is beneficial than using it in the later part of the chemotherapy cycles. A greater difference was evident for hyperfractionated RT as we have already discussed and platinum based chemotherapy. So next one, please. There, there was another article in 2007, so which also discussed, there was a systematic review and meta-analysis of all the randomized control trials, 11 studies. And they also concluded that when platinum based chemotherapy concurrently with chest RT is used, the two and five year survival rates of patients with locally uh, limited stage SCLC may be in favor of early chest radiotherapy with a significant difference if overall treatment time of chest radiation is less than 30 days. Next one. In 2007, uh, another uh, article was published by Andrew T. Ong and Tall. So early radiotherapy, they defined some zero to 20 day of starting of chemotherapy. And this is actually uh, 8,391 patients were included in this study. So, and they, uh, what they have concluded is it supports early initiation of hyperfractionated radiotherapy. And on subgroup analysis, this survival advantage for early RT was significant for patients receiving hyperfractionated radiotherapy, but not for those who receive standard fractionation. So, early uh, RT was associated with a significant improvement in survival. It was 21.9% versus 19.1%. Next one. In 2016, this is the latest one. This was published in Annals of Oncology. And this is an IPD uh, meta-analysis, individual patient data meta-analysis. Meta they have included 12 randomized trials of 2,668 patients. And data on nine trials, that was 2,305 patients were available for IPD meta-analysis. And they defined early radiotherapy is the radiotherapy which has initiated before nine weeks after randomization and before the third cycle of uh, chemotherapy. Uh, next slide. And they have showed that earlier and shorter delivery of thoracic radiotherapy with, with planned CT significantly improves five year overall survival at the expense of more acute toxicity, which is esophagitis, which was previously also. 
uh, we found in other uh, other uh, studies next slide please so what is the recommendation uh, recommended sequencing of concurrent radiotherapy so as per all the trials which we can uh, we can say that when patient receive planned chemotherapy dose so there might be a little bit of increased esophagitis but earlier uh, earlier addition of radiotherapy if we use radiotherapy early so it is obviously beneficial there is one korean randomized control trial which tried to compare between first cycle and third cycle of chemotherapy but no survival or response difference one was found so in clinical practice we can we should initiate chemotherapy as early as possible as we all know it's a very chemo sensitive tumor too and especially when there is a symptomatic patient they respond dramatically and we should not delay chemotherapy for radiation planning so if we need some time for radiation planning we can add the radiotherapy with the second cycle of chemotherapy and which is mostly practiced in most of the centers next slide please so what is the role of post op rt and sbrt is there any role of post op radiotherapy and sbrt next slide please so there as i had previously discussed there is one cohort of patients that is t1 t2 and n0 who might be benefited by surgery and if uh, they are operated then we should uh, we need to know what is the role of post op rt and if they cannot be operated for other medical reasons then is there any role of sbrt like nsc lc next slide please so only 4% of solitary pulmonary nodules are small cell lung cancer and we have extremely limited data available largely it was abandoned due to poor but equivalent outcome compared to radiation so based on british mrc report in 1966 so favorable outcome reported in multiple retrospective studies for stage 1 sclc of surgery in general principle agcc staging should be followed surgical resection mediastinal staging is mandatory and should be followed by adjuvant chemotherapy surgical resection following induction chemotherapy does not improve outcome next one please so adjuvant radiotherapy there are limited data as uh, on uh, role of post operative rt in sclc so the recommendation of indications for rt in this setting is based on the data from non small cell lung cancer so mostly based on experience of port with nsclc and common indications are as we all know in nsclc also margin positive r1 or r2 resection pathologically n2 disease and pn1 is also recommended in some selected review guidelines next slide please so general treatment out, outline of sbrt there are no com complete randomized control trial of sbrt for sclc But so we can we can use we can use the our knowledge of nsclc and we can use sbrt in medically inoperable early stage disease ideally after invasive mediastinal stages because we need to know it's an n0 disease and better to avoid in ultra central tumors as like in nsclc and should be followed by adjuvant chemotherapy there is a survival advantage of adjuvant chemotherapy and is probably provide equal but not superior result than conventional rt and ideally should be incorporated in early phase of treatment next slide please <clears throat> so so what is the do we have any data on outcome of pseudotactic body radiotherapy in t1 t2 n0 small cell lung cancer this is probably the largest data by dr vivek varma mm -hmm. et al from 24 institute 76 lesions were treated in 74 of patients and they concluded that in the largest report of sbrt in T1, T2, N0, SCLC to date. Patient under undergoing primary SBRT should also undergo additional chemotherapy. There is no established role of PCI in this population, and they what they have concluded it. Yes, SBRT does have a role in medically inoperable uh, small cell lung cancer when added with chemotherapy. Next slide, please. So, what is the role of thoracic radiotherapy for extensive disease small cell lung cancer? There is this is a little bit of gray area. so we'll try to find out what is the answer next slide please so there is this landmark trial by bench slotman published in lancet 2015 so 498 patient was randomly assigned and uh, allocated in two groups one is thoracic radiotherapy another is no thoracic radiotherapy for extensive stage, uh, stage lung cancer small cell lung cancer and they analyzed 247 in thoracic radiotherapy group 
and 248 in without thoracic radiotherapy group. And median survival survival was eight months in both the group. At 18 months, survival was 16% versus 9%, which is statistically significant. And at two years, survival was 13% in the thoracic radiotherapy group and only 3% in the control group, which is also statistically significant. And the number of patients needed to treat to avoid one death is 10.6. So the interpretation of thoracic uh, inter interpretation is thoracic radiotherapy in addition to prophylactic cranial radiation should be considered for all patients with extensive stage small cell lung cancer who respond to chemotherapy. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> this is another randomized phase two study. This is NRG uh, oncology RTOG0937 study who randomly assigned only 97 patients and they also uh, compared PCI, only PCI in extensive stages lung disease and PCI with thoracic RT. And they concluded that overall survival exceeded prediction for both arms and thoracic RT delayed progression but did not improve one year overall survival. But we need to consider that this is only a small trial compared to the Flotman style. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> there is another uh, meta-analysis by the Revit Palma group and they have uh, shown actually the two trials were uh, included. One is the Slotman trial and this is the Jeremic trial. And in this meta-analysis, they have showed that thoracic RT is favorable. So they concluded that the systemic review of literature indicates that the use of thoracic RT in extensive stages small cell lung cancer is associated with improved overall survival and progression-free survival. Thoracic RT appears to be well tolerated with no increase in bronchopulmonary toxicity and a small incremental risk of esophagitis. Next slide, please. So these are actually trials which compares the thoracic RT versus no thoracic RT. And as we can see, the Jeremy trial, the Slotman trial, another trial is Zoo et al. and another is O et al. All of the trials shows there is a benefit of addition of thoracic RT in, 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 in the cases where there is no progressive disease after the chemotherapy. Next, next slide, please. So if we consider all the positive data that we have, that is the Jeremy trial and the Slotman's data and David Palma group meta-analysis, we can conclude that thoracic radiotherapy in addition to PCI should be considered for all patients with extensive disease, small cell lung cancer who respond to chemotherapy. Next slide, please. So there is a letter to editor there, there um, by uh, Dr. Slotman, and here they, he has clearly said that they conclude that thoracic RT should be offered to patients with good or partial response after chemotherapy, but not those without residual disease in the th thorax. So if after chemotherapy there is no residual disease, probably there is no benefit of adding consolidative thoracic RT. Next slide, please. And so as uh, for extensive disease lung disease for consolidative RT, what we can we we can rec we can uh, we can conclude that there is 20 to 25 percent response to chemotherapy and 75 percent persistent disease after chemotherapy with 90 percent intrathoracic progression at uh, one year and with these three RCTs and one meta analysis there is overall survival and progression free survival benefit when added to prophylactic cranial radiation and there is a less chance of intrathoracic progression also, and there is no significant toxicity difference. The recommended dose for, dose for extensive disease, disease is 30 grain 10 fraction in two weeks of time. Next slide, please. Next, we come to prophylactic cranial radiation. Next, please. Yeah. Next slide, please. Yeah. So for SCLC, what is the rationale and evidence of PCI? We have a PCI meta-analysis of seven trials of 987 patients and uh, several RCTs consistently demonstrated reduced incidence of brain meds when PCI is added after response to initial therapy. And this meta-analysis by Operin et al. in 1999 clearly shows that, uh, that there is a benefit of PCI when added after chemotherapy. Next, please. I will wrap up soon. So there is multiple RCTs and meta-analysis consistent risk ratio of 0.45 to 0.5 in favor of PCI and can be extrapolated to support PCI in partial responders also going to difference 
in how response are assessed using modern imaging because previously they were imaged only with x-ray now we have ct scan to uh, measure the response so post concurrent ctrt for non progressive disease pci is indicated next please so ideal dose fractionation is 25 gray in 10 fraction over two years of time whole brain next next slide please so for extensive stage lung disease there is a bit of conflicting data there is a little a few data of mr cyber lens and when there is a recurrence then they have added radiotherapy and there are some data which shows that there there is uh, if we add pci in extensive disease there is significantly decrease brain metastasis burden when pci is added so pci dose for extensive disease is 25 gray in 10 fraction over two weeks and in some cases 20 gray in five fraction is also used next next slide please so this is the uh, this is the uh, data published in 2017 it's a multicentric open randomized open level phase 3 data which compared pci versus observation in extensive stage small cell lung cancer next uh, next slide please so which has uh, uh, which has shows that prophylactic uh, uh, cranial radiation did not result in longer overall survival compared to compared to observation in patient with extensive disease disease and prophylactic cranial radiation is therefore not essential for patient with extensive disease disease with small cell lung cancer with any response to initial chemotherapy and a confirmed absence of brain metastasis when patient received periodic mri examination during follow up so you need to remember that they have done periodic MRI examination, which may not be feasible in all the centers. Next, next slide, please. So there is a little bit of data about hippocampal sparing in PCI. Only two slides I will show and I will wrap up. Next slide, please. So there is one data uh, of 70 patients published in 20, uh, 2014 by Vijay Anand uh, Kundapur and et al. And they concluded that overall incidence of hippocampal metastasis before or after uh, PCI is very low. So preliminary support that hippocampal can be avoided uh, during PCI. Next slide, please. And there is another data from Amsterdam 168 patient from Netherlands NKI AVL. And they concluded that, that uh, safety and they reported that the incidence and location of brain metastasis after treatment of hippocampal sparing PCI compared to standard PCI is safe. With a median follow up of 24.6 months, there was no significant difference in the incidence of brain meds between standard PCI and hippocampal avoidance PCI. None of the patient developed single brain metastasis in the hippocampus or hippocampus avoidance region. Next, please. So there is another data called premier trial from Spain of 118 patients, and they concluded that there was significant decline in memory in PCI group and further investigation to assess the impact of long-term follow-up is in progress. Next, please. And this is, this is presented in ISTRO 38 in 2019 from NKI AVL. And this is this 168 patients data. And there is no significant difference between the two arm they have shown in terms of HVLDR recall score if hippocampal is spared. The incidence of brain recurrence was not increased in avoidance region. But there is no cognitive benefit also. Next, next slide, please. So there is one ongoing trial, Energy Oncology CC009 by Dr. Binay Gondi and team. And they are doing a phase three trial. Before publishing of this trial, we have this ASTRO guideline. Next slide, please. So, which uh, says that the strategies to reduce the risk of neuro neurotoxicity, including medical intervention and hippocampal avoidance PCI are currently being assessed in this trial. And the rate of brain metastasis failure from this approach is yet to be defined in this population. So before the publication of NRGCC003 trial, probably we should, we should uh, practice the conventional PCI only, not hippocampal avoidance. Next slide, please. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Probably I have uh, exceeded my time and sorry for that. And thank you again. I want to acknowledge Dr. Jibak Bhattacharya because he has, I have borrowed a few slides from him. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sain. I'm, I think we are short of time. But uh, uh, till the time uh, that uh, Dr. Ritesh's uh, slides are loaded up, uh, maybe uh, uh, if anybody wants to ask a question, quick question, we can do. 
okay if there are no no questions then we'll move on to the next uh, next session uh, this next session uh, is a panel discussion on rectal cancer of course we would have loved to have dr avikanan uh, with us but then he's traveling somewhere and he is unable to log in uh, because of the poor connection there so we have dr ritesh tapkire the head of surgical oncology at uh, kacha cancer center and he will be joined by the pan panelists dr abhijit taluk talukdar uh, who is the associate professor of sur surgical oncology at bibarua uh, dr gautam sharma who is the associate professor of radiation oncology at bibarua um, dr umesh das who is a consultant medical oncologist in guwahati dr uh, and dr yukren kongla the uh, the associate professor of pathology at uh, nigrims and also dr akash handik the associate professor of uh, radiology from nigrims uh, over to dr ritesh uh, uh, good evening everyone uh, so i'm just filling in uh, as uh, dr kalev has said for dr ravi kannan so uh, without wasting much time uh, i would welcome all the panelists and we'll start with the uh, case scenario for the management of rectal cancer so yeah so there is a 25 year old man with tenesmus and bleeding per rectum for uh, six months duration management managed conservatively as hemorrhoids recent onset uh, abdominal distension with recurrent colicky abdominal pain presented with subacute intestinal obstruction the examination showed circumferential ulcerating lesion not admitting the examining examining finger commencing at 6 cm from the anal verge with restricted mobility biopsy showed mu uh, mucin secreting adenocarcinoma grade 3 so how we will manage the patient uh, this is a question to the uh, uh, surgical oncologist or surgeon in the team i think dr abhijit is there or dr siddharth yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so this patient locally will is my is uh, am i audible yeah 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 so yeah. do you image the patient with mri mri pelvis so we do a local staging we will see the uh, the t tumor the size of the uh, lesion the extent of the lesion then involvement of the mesorectum nodal involvement and the mesorectal facial involvement so that uh, mri alone would be sufficient i think we have a, a radiologist in the panel dr akash is there so is there any advantage of doing mri over ct scan for the local imaging uh, dr akash sandeep is not joined in okay. yes so uh, uh, dr vijit you tell me yeah, uh, yeah since it's since you say that is a 6 cm lesion middle mid rectum involving uh, the upper extent we don't know so I, mri is better in delineating the mesorectal fascia the nodal involvement then it will prognosticate because it's a mucin secreting adenocarcinoma any form of lymphovascular invasion is present or not so all the prognostic local prognostic factors can be uh, delineated with the mri so uh, the mri for the pelvis alone would be sufficient or would no, you like no. to do any other imaging for yeah then we have to of... image the liver with yeah. a ct scan uh, abdomen and thorax okay so for uh, uh, for staging work up you you said that ct scan contrast ct scan is necessary and for local yeah. imaging mri is uh, as a key uh, this advantage over ct scan yes. correct yes. yeah i think yes. that is true because mri actually it is better for the soft tissue delineation mm. and there are studies which have shown that you know that mri clear crm actually there is a you can differentiate by doing mri whether the crm is yes. involved or not yeah so uh, they are correct what about the uh, is there any role of doing pet ct scan in upfront setting we don't do pet ct scan okay because Uh, the advantage is not to... there. Yeah, correct, Can correct. To... The PET CT is not indicated for the primary staging of rectal Can cancer. Can I ask a question? Yes, an equivocal finding. Can I ask so, a question? Yeah, yeah, please. I want to know the hemoglobin of the patient. Pardon? Hemoglobin. Hemoglobin. Hemoglobin of the patient. Nine point five gram. Oh, which is uh, which is the five point six? I will uh, go for a hemostatic RT. Oh, okay, okay. Because you have to because skin rectum can bleed. Let them bleed. Okay, suppose uh, Doctor Gautam is also there. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. 
Okay, Gautam, one question to you. If suppose yes, yes. we consider hemostatic RT in this situation, would it affect the total dose of radiation? Oh, yeah, sleep. Oh, sleep. Yeah, no, before that, uh, sleep, sleep, sleep. Yeah. we have to know the staging properly. Okay. Okay. Ah, whether the intention is palliative or curative. Curative. Suppose it is curative. Is that... Yes. Yeah. We, can, we can give a hemostatic RT if required. And uh, since uh, we'll get some time in between, so I don't th think that it is going to affect the curative dose of radiotherapy or the new adjuvant dose of radiotherapy. Ah, you will be able to give complete uh, 50.4 gray of radiation ah. if giving hemostatic RT, correct? So That's what you meant to say. Uh, if, if suppose for hemostatic RT, I'm giving like 5 gray in a single dose, mm -hmm. Control the bleeding. So later on, maybe I won't go for 50.4, at least 45 I will give. That will not affect the outcome of the radiation? No, no. It's the outcome on the tumor per se? No, no. It should, not, it should not affect it. Depends on the time that, that I will get after the hemostatic RT. Actually, I have to calculate like that. Okay, okay. so just leave it. Actually, generally, the other thing which would, I would like to ask our surgeons that since this is a there is subacute inter intestinal obstruction, would you like to do a diversion colostomy? Yeah, yeah. Uh, because in your rec rectal findings, you have said that the finger is not admitted. So we have to see whether patient has got any symptoms of obstruction. No, no, there so is subacute yes. intestinal obstruction. So then we have to divert. Okay. It is. Okay. I have a very small question. It is. Can yeah. you hear me? Yes. Yes. This is a young patient and mucin secreting adenocarcinoma. This uh, mucin secreting this is a very eminent, different group of people, a different group of, group of cancer, not uh, very mana, synonymous with the adult uh, adenocarcinoma of the rectum. That this type of patients, now biological behavior is very aggressive and very behave very badly. So it should be treated a little bit different way than conventional way. Managing rectal cancer, I believe. How would you approach this patient? Oh, that is true. Yeah. This patient to subacute obstruction, obviously, you have to do a colostomy. Uh, then after yeah. that, how would you approach differently? Uh, yes. uh, I believe that thorough examination and metastatic workup to be done because very aggressive disease. This is a very aggressive disease. And uh, I think there is a role of PET CT because if you do proper study, then there is always chance of getting mats here and there, maybe bone mats also, this type of thing. But PET CT actually, if you see the uh, PET CT, it depends on the glucose uptake and mucin secreting tumors. Probably the cellularity will not be much high. Till now, mm -hmm. there is but, no uh, recommendation uh, but... to use PET CT. Pardon? Till now, there is no recommendation to use PET yeah, CT. That's what for the primary staging workup. Unless there is some equivocal finding. <laughs> There is no indication of doing PET no, CT for no, no, I'm not stage. talking about the, the, this type of patients. I have seen this. The young patient, yeah. mucin secreting adrenal carcinoma, behave very badly. Whatever you do, majority patient dies okay, in now, one year. Okay, I, I understood. So we will go to the next thing. So probably we have to deal uh, these patients like in you know, a little differently. But I think uh, what we have come uh, to know for, so far that for local imaging, MRI is better than CT scan of the abdomen and for uh, distant to rule out distant metastasis, we have to do a contrast enhanced CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis, and of course, we can add a CT scan of the chest also. Now, is what there any role of endoscopic PA? ultrasound? Is what there any role of Pardon? Baseline CEA. Yeah. Baseline CEA is 4.4. Uh, okay, fine. Yeah. So, is there any role of endoscopic ultrasound in, the, in this scenario? So this is a locally advanced lesion, so there is no, and moreover, there is an obstructive lesion, so there is no way we can do endoscopic ultrasound. So, uh, okay, so we will proceed with diversion colostomy. Patient has undergone diversion colostomy. What next? What would you like to do next? Patient has a locally advanced cancer as per the imaging. Yeah. This MRI is showing mass lesion infiltrating full thickness of the rectum in contact with the levator and eye muscle. And small lymph nodes are there in the mesorectum. So this is a uh, T3. This is a T3 lesion with N1 nodes with involvement yeah. of the uh, levator and I. So it's a low rectal cancer. So yeah. I will stage it as a high risk group and go for uh, neoadjuvant 
Kimo Art. So, uh, new and everyone agrees on that new adjuvant yes. treatment. Yes, yes. Sir, there is a no uh, some nodule in the lung also. Hi, Doctor Umesh here. Yeah. Says so it is showing some nodule in the lung also. Yeah, I think. Uh, that is an equivocal finding. It is a very small nodule actually. This is only four millimeter four nodule. Millimeter. So uh, I think we can just okay uh, four millimeter nodule. nodule. Yeah, yeah. No, I will go for CTRT actually. Okay. So uh, what chemotherapy will you give? And this radiation is going to be short course, short course radiation or regular conventional radiation? A long course radiation. Conventional. Now, according to rap rapido trial, we can go for short course also. Short course radiation alone? After that, chemotherapy will be added. Okay. But conventionally, okay. what we are practicing right now is that we give... Uh, yes, right uh, now, we are practicing the long course only because this rapido trial, it, uh, the median, this thing uh, is only for 4.6 years, the follow-up data. Yeah. And years. for long course, we have a big data. So I think uh, the, the patient had received conventional uh, radiation dose with... Uh, and what chemotherapy would you like to give? Dr. Umesh is there. Dr. Umesh? Yeah, okay. most of the patient we are uh, giving capacitabin only, oral capacitabin. In this case, okay. also we can give capacitabin as because already diversion colostomy is there. Okay. Yeah, I think in most of the places now they have switched over to oral capacitabin along with radiation. Yes, yes. So, uh, patient completed uh, 25 fractions of radiation, 50.4 gray along with oral capacitabin. And how will you reassess the patient after new adjuvant treatment? Suppose, uh, what would be the investigation and uh, imaging to reassess the patient? So, I will... Uh, I will reassess with MRI again to see the local like uh, response for the treatment, whether what uh, whether the levator and I planes are uh, involved or not. Then the okay. any mesorectal fascia is free or not. That I will uh, evaluate then to evaluate with, with uh, again a metastatic workup with CT abdomen and thorax contrast enhance. And if suppose there is complete clinical response and. Suppose there is no disease on MRI, there is no thickening in the rectum and there are no uh, obviously enlarged lymph nodes. What would be your treatment approach in this patient? If and if suppose there is residual disease, I will give you both the scenarios. There is a residual disease and there is no residual disease on imaging and clinically. So how will you approach differently both the scenarios? <coughs> if there, there is residual approach. Yeah, if there is no res uh, if there is no residual disease, we can try the con organ preservation with weight and what approach. But patient has to be counselled. This patient is a young patient. Uh, will need a regular follow up. That has to be explained. If patient is from a far off places who cannot do follow up regularly, then I will even without uh, clinically no disease, I would like to take this patient for surgery, if patient is willing for surgery. Yeah, I so think correct. communication is the, very important with the patient. Yeah, I think uh, very true. Actually, the uh, observation after complete clinical response is more or less uh, investigational. Very few uh -huh. patients would be willing to do that. And even the surgeon would be reluctant to keep the patient under observation. Because whatever investigation we, we do, whether it is MRI, CT scan or PET CT, no investigation will, add, uh, will, will tell us completely that the patient has... Uh, uh, complete clinical response or uh, like, you know, something like pathological complete response. So it is more or less investigational and uh, most of the patient would undergo surgery after uh, new adjuvant uh, CTRT. So what surgery would you like to do? So we have to see the MRI films, whether the levator NI is involved or not, whether the, if there is, now if, it is it free. Is, if you yeah. are, and there are no, no obvious lymph nodes, very minimum thickening in the rectum. And uh, clinically also, there is some indication in the, at the site of the original disease. So I will go for resping, ult, ultra low uh, coloanal anastomosis. Right, With right, patient right. being counseled properly, that the yeah. patient will have repeated uh, di, uh, loose tools, then he will need a covering ileostomy. So that all has to be counseled that uh, ileostomy maybe have to keep for longer time. 
he may be, he may be requiring colostomy be. for a longer period of time. So all those counseling has to be done with the patient before we go for a colonoanastomosis. So now we have a pathologist in the panel. So uh, suppose once we have done the ultra low anterior resection, how will you do the grossing? Whether uh, it is preferable to do the grossing in the fresh specimen or would you like to do the formalin fixation and then do the uh, grossing? What would be the minimum number of lymph nodes would you, would you like to you know, uh, dissect to give the accurate staging? Yeah, regarding the grossing, uh, we would first like to fix the specimen, but be before that, actually, we have to identify the surfaces and ink the right surfaces. And then we would like to fix the specimen properly before we actually gross, because uh, after it is fixed, it is uh, much easier for us to see the areas which are detected and especially the depth of invasion on the gross specimen. And after that, of course, the TNM staging, we will be giving the uh, PT4, then we will be uh, grossing the lymph nodes. At this point of time, uh, uh, of course, uh, lymph nodes, we should get at least minimum of 12. That would be a good grossing for the lymph node. And uh, of course, the margins. I think, but sometimes actually post CTRT, the number of uh, the- Post CTRT, are... yes. Post CTRT, the uh, number of lymph nodes uh, definitely is reduced. The yield is definitely and, reduced. And would you like to uh, make any special comment on the uh, mesorectal fascia? Yes, because definitely. Yeah, the yeah. The at the, uh, at the level of, yes, at the level of gross uh, examination, we should look at the mesorectal excision whether it's a complete excision or whether it's a partial or whether it's a, uh, no, like we look at the irregularity of the mesorectum of the CRM. And, and uh, uh, like, uh, uh, since this is a post CTRT, uh, histopathologically the PT4, we would give the tumor regression grading. Okay, yeah, that's correct. We need to give the tumor regression grading, correct. So to Dr. Abhijit Talukdar, how much distal margin would you like to take? This is a post-CTRT case. Uh, at least a one centimeter margin we should have. On uh, grossing? Yeah, plus one centimeter margin. Okay. And uh, would, you, would you wait for the frozen section before yeah, you if attempt? If you have, to... if you are not able to palpate the lesion, if you're not clear of your margins during surgery, then it's always a good practice to send for frozen. Okay. Okay, suppose suppose the same patient has a solitary liver metastasis. Would it like to? Would it change your management? Yeah, if it is a liver metastasis, then we have to uh, evaluate the quantum of uh, the liver involvement. If it is just a solitary metastasis, which doesn't require a large resection, then we can go for a. If it is not a major resection, then we can go for combined resection also. No, no. Would it change your approach? Suppose there is a solitary liver metastasis. Patient has... Okay, before we go to the liver metastasis, I have one more question uh, to the uh, medical oncologist. So, suppose this patient, how would you decide about the adjuvant chemotherapy? Like, you know, patient has received neoadjuvant CTRT, patient has undergone surgery, and now there is a... Yes, sir. This is a case of actually T4 disease. T4... T4 disease as per MRI report. Mm -hmm. So all the cases, those who receive CTRT, we have to give the chemotherapy, adjuvant chemotherapy, most of the cases. Although data is not sufficient, but this is a high risk case, we have to give adjuvant chemotherapy in this case after what, surgery. What chemotherapy would you like to give? We can give Either Folfox or Capox, depending okay, upon the yeah, depending yeah, upon the difference of the patient. Those patients who have received new adjuvant CTRT, irrespective of the post-op histopathology report, they should receive adjuvant chemotherapy. Yes. Unless yes. unless there are some issues which would con contraindicate chemotherapy. Yes, yes. Otherwise, we have to consider chemotherapy for all the patients all who the have patients. received new form of treatment. Okay, so now coming to this scenario, Ganesh can also contribute. Okay, so there is a solitary liver metastasis. Patient presented with subacute intestinal obstruction. Patient has undergone diversion colostomy. Now, what would be the change in the treatment approach? Would you like to consider the patient for again for see this 
solitary liver metastasis means the intent of treatment would be curative. Yes. This is not palliative. Yes. This has to be curative. So, would you like to consider new adjuvant CTRT, like with conventional radiation, capacitabin, followed by surgery for primary as well as liver? Or would you like to give new adjuvant chemotherapy and then reassess the patient? What would be the difference? What would be your approach? Pritesh, it'd be nice if you can uh, just ask quick uh, responses from everybody and finish. Please. Yes, yes, yes. So, Dr. Abhijit, we'll yeah. start with you and then probably Dr. Yeah. Gautam can contribute or Dr. Ganesh can contribute. Solitary liver yes. metastasis. Solitary liver metastasis is a metastatic disease. So, yeah. but though, but my intent of treatment will be curative. So, yeah. I will image the liver with the MRI liver to see the volume of disease. Is it really a true solitary liver metastasis or we are seeing just the solitary nodule? So if it is solitary liver, truly solitary liver metastasis, then I can go for short course uh, RT followed by chemotherapy, consolidated chemotherapy. Then we reevaluate if its response is there, then we go, go for surgery. Surgery in the form of uh, local wide excision for the liver and uh, whatever we have planned in rectal cancer surgery for uh, the primary. But why not conventional CTRT? Because there also we are giving capacitabin because it's already a metastatic disease. Yeah, we know, but uh, then high, we have to treat both. Even the rectal all, cancer is also uh, locally advanced. But if the solitary liver metastasis is not a central lesion, peripheral lesion, mm -hmm. we think it's a, not a major resection, morbidity is not there, then we can go for uh, uh, wide excision in the first setting also. Yeah, I think yeah, that, that actually both the approaches are correct. Actually, we can... Yeah. Why not index on chemotherapy? If we give induction chemotherapy, then uh, local as well as systemic uh, that will act systematically. Yeah, but, then we have to treat, but the problem but then is then that rectum is a T4 lesion. Rectum then, is yeah, a T4 lesion. Yeah, that's right. We will give neoadjuvant, neoadjuvant therapy, like induction, not neoadjuvant, induction chemotherapy okay. followed by CTRT. Okay. Yeah, both the approaches are correct, actually. Both yeah. can be done. And, uh, uh, you know, that neoadjuvant CTRT followed by surgery for both primary as well as liver that can be attempted or you can do the surgery for primary and keep primary. the liver under observation, give the chemotherapy and then reassess the liver and bring the patient back for uh, surgery. That also can be done. Can All be. the approaches are correct depending on the general condition of the patient and uh, resources available in the institution. Okay. Yes. And one more thing actually, yeah, before we attempt the liver metastasis, it is a good practice to do the improper ultrasound to make yes. sure that this is the only disease which we are dealing with. Yes. Now, True. uh, Multiple liver metastasis, I, I think it is pretty clear that, you know, the intent of uh, treatment would be palliative in case of multiple liver metastasis. So here, I think probably we can go for induction chemotherapy. Uh, Dr. Omesh is there or Gautam, they can comment. Yeah, yeah. yeah, in case of multiple liver metastasis, we have to give the induction chemotherapy followed by reasis. So here the treatment would be more or less palliative only. So uh, we will just continue the chemo. At any point of time, do we consider uh, treating the primary with by radiation? Dr. Gautam, yeah. would it be possible yeah, if, to if, give if, 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 if the patient have any local symptoms, we should go with palliative RT. Okay. 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 Uh, so should we, uh, Caleb is telling to, I think. Can I uh, ask a question? Can I ask a question? Oh. Oh, I, I, I want to I ask you a question. I, I think uh, Pritesh, uh, Dr. Uh, Akash Andik is joined in. Maybe uh, he wants to add in on uh, role of... Uh, yes, yes, yes. Please, please, Akash. Akash we were again. waiting for you. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I think there question? was a little bit... Can I ask you a question? Yes, yes. Oh, if you have solitary yes, yes. liver with uh, response with chemotherapy, and there is... Uh, in imaging, there is a complete yes, response yes. to your second emergency. How are you are going to do surgery? Yeah, yeah nowadays that. what they do is they for like what we mm -hmm. practice in breast that we put uh, markers there. So we can put markers there and then if there is response, that area we can excise. Yeah. Akash, would you like to comment on that? If suppose yeah, Akash and Dick, uh, can maybe can uh, come in and comment on that. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. For, for solitary metastasis, especially uh, like uh, or even maybe few metastases like three in number, which are uh, say three four centimeter and this thing. 
so apart from that i think uh, definitely this thermal ablation has a role uh, with microwave ablation uh, and uh, which has uh, which is now superseding radio frequency ablation they uh, they tend to give uh, uh, give uh, margins uh, uh, as good as or better than the surgical margins because uh, we can target the lesion as well and we can uh, give the end here heat sink effect which was a disadvantage earlier with the rfa systems that is also not there so maybe i think uh, uh, microwave ablation especially is uh, one uh, which we would like to uh, uh, keep in the armamentarium for these patients and would you like to comment on uh, uh, sir's comment that suppose if there is complete response radiological response patient had a liver metastasis yes. up front yeah. giving chemotherapy there is complete radiological yes. response. how would we approach dr akash Huh, nee, if there is a response, obviously yes, patient yes. has to be for, uh, kept on follow up. But if uh, if it again uh, 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 it again relapses, it can be done. And uh, what we have seen, at least in, with the chemoembolization, is that uh, the uh, RFA and uh, and uh, chemoembolization has a synergistic role. So uh, we uh, we would like to look into whether uh, chemotherapy plus RFA has a synergistic role as well or not. because uh, what happens is that not only uh, the uh, when we do these uh, ablations then what ha uh, happens is the area which, which is uh, which uh, where, where the tissue is viable there also there is lot of hyperemia which remains for quite some time so uh, whatever chemo and these things is given the up, uh, pro, i mean at least in chemo ablation we have seen that the uptake is better and response is better Uh, i don't know whether same thing can be uh, interpolated for chemotherapy i think well. i think i think that we have to address the liver lesion some way because the, the chances of uh, having a residual disease at the site of the liver would be close to 30 to 40% so we have to address it some way the second thing is suppose we are planning to do some liver resection then we have to restrict the number of chemotherapy because auxiliary platin is known to cause some liver damage so that can have some problem you know after liver resection I think the Kellen is telling me, is pointing me to. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Laptop is also telling there is out of battery, so we'll. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> we would have loved to continue. Thank you very much, Dr. Abhijit and uh, Dr. Gautam, Dr. Ganesh, Dr. Akash, Dr. Kongla. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Um, thank you. We'll, we'll go on with the next session. Uh, that is uh, uh, the session on lung cancer. Of course, we have finished one talk already. So I invite the panel, uh, the uh, chairperson, Dr. Uh, B. J. Saikia. Dr. Bargav Saikia is the uh, head of medical oncology at uh, Bhiburoa Cancer Institute, and uh, and uh, Dr. Bihari Agarwal. He is a consultant uh, surgical oncologist from Bhiburgar. Sir, please start, sir. Uh, sir, if you can in introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Ulas Patra. Sir, Saikia, sir. Hello, I am trying to contact. Okay, battery is uh, battery is off. So uh, I request my uh, speaker to say immunology speaker. Initially, immunology is supposed to be the part of immunology in lung cancer. Kindly request the part immunology in cancer. Request doctor. Well, let's do the next lecture. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Dr. Patra, we can see your screen. Dr. Ulasu Patra will uh, deliver the lecture of immunotherapy. He, I know him. I, he is a good lecturer. We will be enlightened by his lecture. Uh, thank you, sir. And uh, I heard the very intriguing and very uh, heated panel discussion on rectal cancer. And in the front of them, I think the immunotherapy lecture might be a bit boring. Uh, and I would like to, and I think we are running late by around forty minutes, so I would like to keep it short. Uh, so uh, these are the. I will make it is interesting. Don't worry. <laughs> I will ask you some questions. I will ask you some questions. It will be difficult to, for you to answer. Fantastic, sir. So these are the yes. available immunotherapy options in the management of non-small cell lung cancer. You can give either. single gene immunotherapy or immuno plus chemotherapy or you can give a immuno plus uh, atezo plus chemotherapy or you can io and io agents uh, so you know these are plethora of agents which are available in the management of non small cell lung cancers so i'm yes. sure the feeling amongst everybody right now is confused unsure unclear perplexed i am disoriented right now and bewildered is what the audience would be 
Uh, so how do you decide once you have a patient of lung cancer in front of you? You can either listen to the stirrings of your heart, you know, you can uh, pick up one uh, out of this, you can put your hand inside and put up one uh, uh, treatment, or you can look at the evidence. So I think I would like to show you the evidence actually uh, what is used for uh, uh, immunotherapy. So why do we need a strategy for immunotherapy? Because immunotherapy, although a game changer, does not work in all the patients. Immunotherapy can be used alone. So can it be used with chemotherapy and so can it be used with IOIO combination. In certain patients, single agent immunotherapy is enough. When in others, an IO combination may be more potent. The financial toxicity of immunotherapy is substantial. Thus, the need to identify a biomarker that will help the clinicians to decide the optimal regimen. So, I would like to say, my needs are simple. All I want is everything. We are typical medical oncologists. We want a biomarker which will tell us whether this will act or this will not act. Uh, what benefit are, is patient going to get from there? So, what is the best strategy for optimizing uh, immunotherapy in non-small cell lung cancer? Easy. Find a biomarker. You know, as Sherlock Holmes would have said, it's actually elementary, you know. Get a biomarker who will tell us whether this thing is going to work or not. It's almost like an ER, PR, or HER2 new. If you are ER, PR positive, you will work. If you are not, it will not work. So what are the available biomarkers in non-small cell lung cancer? You can have either a TPS scoring by PDL one or you can have a tumor mutation burden. Tumor mutation burden actually is going out of vogue in treatment in lung cancer. So I will focus my talk mainly on the PDL1 uh, strata. And we will see that, uh, let's look at the evidence of immunotherapy. Let's start with the second line non small cell lung cancer. Uh, because in God we trust, rest, everybody should bring the data. So there were two pivotal <laughs> trials of immunotherapy in second line NACLC where uh, nivolumab was compared against chemotherapy. And this basically showed that there was a small but consistent OS benefit in second line non small cell lung cancer. OS benefit for medical oncologists is huge because we do not usually get OS benefits in our uh, in, in our armamentarium. But here, what we could actually found out was there was a slight advantage of uh, immunotherapy as a single agent in second line immunotherapy. So this is the OS in all the nivolumab treated patients from Checkmate 3, 63, 17, 27. Now, what I would like to show you was the median OS is 10.3, but look at the tail of the tail. People who respond are the ones who are going to live for two years, three years, and four years also. So the tail of the tail here is very, very important. Now, this on the right-hand side or left-hand side, please see if you have PDL1 less than one, or if you have a PDL1 more than one, it doesn't make a difference. Nivolumab will respond in second line NACLC, irrespective of whether you have a PDL1 more than one or less than one. So PDL1 as a biomarker in second line non small cell lung cancer. Is a neutral. If you have more, it's good, but it is not that if you do not have PDL1, people will not respond. Now, moving immunotherapy to first line non small cell lung cancer. So, I spoke about second line. Second line for immunotherapy, especially nivolumab or otezolizumab, you do not require a PDL1 as a biomarker. Now, in the first line, immunotherapy can be given in three ways. One, it can be given alone. Second, it can be given in combination with IO chemo. Third, it can be given in combination with IO-IO. So which Dr. Sendhil Rajapa very rightly says is IIO combination. So let's look at the data about immunotherapy in the frontline NACLC alone in place of chemotherapy. So you can give immunotherapy alone. You do not give chemotherapy. And there are four pivotal trials in this, okay, five trials. One is Keynote 24, 42, uh, two positive trials, Empower 110, positive trial. Checkmate and mistake was a negative trial. So let's look at the Keynote 24 trial. This was the first trial which differentiated pembrolizumab versus a histology based chemotherapy, which was given for around six cycles. And in this, this was the data which was presented. And you can look at the uh, 18 months OS. 61% of people actually lived for, uh, had a uh, OS at 18 months. Remember? Our earlier years, Dr. Sergio would remember, lung cancer people used to live not more than six to eight months. This was the data which was presented by Julie Palmer, a five-year survival of 32% in a stage four lung cancer is something which, is, which was never even heard, never even spoken, never even imagined in the era that lung cancer treatment was actually started over there. This data was presented by Julie Palmer at ESMO 2020. 
and this uh, led to a lot of uh, uh, flying cases to all the uh, from all the patients to all the medical oncologists actually who were treating empro was not the only agent atezolizumab was compared with chemotherapy and again this trial showed basically that the hr so if your pdl1 is more than 50 and you give either a single agent atezolizumab or a pembrolizumab you are much better than chemotherapy now this i spoke about more than 50 now let's say if you have a higher pdl1 in immunotherapy let's say somebody has a pdl1 of 90 to 100% was a was a pdl1 of 50 to 89% so people who had a pdl1 of more than 90 to 100% did even better so the higher the pdl1 in the first line if you have two agents that is either atezolizumab or pembrolizumab definitely you are going to you can replace chemotherapy with immunotherapy this was another trial in which semipelimab was compared as a single agent versus uh, chemotherapy this trial also showed that patients with a uh, higher pdl1 levels are the ones who respond much better to the other agent so the higher the pdl1 in the first line setting untreated setting if you use single agent immunotherapy you can actually do much much better than that so i spoke about pdl1 more than 50% let's get greedy you know we as medical oncologists are very very greedy we feel everything is ours so let's try immunotherapy in all the patients of pdl1 positivity so a stage 1 a stage 4 nsclc if you have a pdl1 more than 50% you will benefit from single agent immunotherapy now let's look at any pdl1 positive that is more than 1% positive now this was the keynote 42 design which compared a single agent pembrolizumab versus chemotherapy and again as you said this agent was this uh, trial was a positive trial and pembrolizumab was bound to be superior to chemotherapy but Uh, and the pembrolizumab was approved by fda for metastatic nsclc with pdl1 more than 2 uh, with more than 1% but wait there is more to it what meets the eye we all know the story of titanic uh, we all the tip of the iceberg now i will show you the story about that now pdl1 more than 50% could be uh, pdl1 more than 50% could be pdl1 more than 50% and it could be pdl more 1 to 49% so what was shown in this trial was that the majority of the benefit which was being driven was given by the people who had pdl1 more than 50 so let us say we had a uh, 50 people of pdl1 more than 50 these were the guys who were driving the maximum benefit and shifting the curve if you look at uh, overall survival between tps from 1 to 49 it was not really found to be successful so in my opinion single agent immunotherapy is not supposed to be given if you have a pdl uh, between 1 to 49% so you should always read in between the lines and find out what exactly are we dealing with so we spoke about three positive trials now uh, you know medical oncologists will never ever show the negative data but i will show you some negative data about nivolumab versus chemotherapy in first line non cancer lung cancer and this was a data which was compared nivolumab was compared against chemotherapy and this was a negative trial if you see whether you have a pdl1 more than 5% 10% 50% this data was not significant for overall survival and nivolumab as a single agent immunotherapy is not approved in the treatment of first line metastatic nsclc so our strategy to use pdl1 i would say in first line uh, egf uh, in first line non small cell lung cancer the pdl1 report does make a difference and that is what uh, the dancer the higher the higher the pdl1 level the more better the chance of responses so we spoke about immunotherapy alone let me take you to immunotherapy and chemotherapy now uh, so there are six trials again we spoke about six trials initially we are going to speak about six more trials now but i am going to concentrate only on the positive two trials so this was a keynote 189 study in which pembro plus chemo was compared to only chemotherapy in the initial trial we were comparing immunotherapy against chemotherapy here we are comparing immunotherapy plus chemotherapy versus chemotherapy what this trial found out was that again the amount of difference between pembro and uh, plus immuno plus chemo versus only chemotherapy is almost like the survival advantage which we see with an r chop versus chop based regimen and again if you can see a 18 month survival of probably more than 70% is 
and this data is actually with IPL coming up is you know it's a whistle podu uh, kind of a uh, uh, data. Now, is there a role of PDL one? No, there is no role of PDL one if you are going to give a immunochemotherapy. Whether you have a PDL one less than one percent, one to forty nine percent, more than fifty percent, it does not really make a difference. Now, that was an adenocarcinoma. Now let's look at a uh, squamous cell carcinoma, different trial, same result. The keynote 407 trial, again, it was found out that a immuno plus chemo combination was better uh, than only chemo combination in uh, stage four NACLC with any PDL1 levels. Again, if you see PDL1 less than 1%, 1 to 49%, more than 40%, it did not make a difference. So our strategy of finding a biomarker to select an IO chemo combination uh, while uh, deciding IO chemo, uh, not really, you know, I mean, it, it, it doesn't make a difference whether you have a PDL1 uh, 25 or a 75, you probably are going to give the same if you want to give immuno and chemotherapy or not. Now, let's look at the IO, IO combinations, uh, very complicated trials. Uh, I will just take you to two trials. Uh, one is Checkmate 227 where NEVO EP was compared to only NEVO versus compared to only uh, chemotherapy. And what this data showed basically was that if you have a PDL1 more than 1%, NEVO and EP is better than chemotherapy, which is also better than nivolumab. So PDL1 more than 1%, the IO IO combination is better. But if you have a PDL1 less than 1%, your uh, IO IO combination is still better than a single agent immunotherapy or a chemotherapy. So it didn't really materialize over here. Now, uh, we spoke about IO IO. Now, let's talk about a small uh, checkmate 9 LA complication, which was a IO IO plus chemo combination. Again, it was basically chemo here was given only for two cycles actually. And what we can actually find out over here in this study was. Uh, that there was a survival benefit with this small IO IO combination chemotherapy, and it didn't really make a difference about what kind of level uh, you actually had over there. So PDL1 expression again did not make a difference over here. So PDL1 as a biomarker while deciding IO IO, not really. So I'm sure the audience feeling at this time is absolutely being confused. Uh, you know, you don't know what to make it out for you. I'll make it simple for you. So last five slides, people are still away. If you have a no, newly diagnosed patients of non-small cell lung cancer, make sure it is non-oncogene directed. Please do a EGFR IL cross. If you do a EGFR IL cross and if it is mutated or amplified, please do not give immunotherapy because it is not going to work. Look for the burden of disease. Look for the PDL1 status. So let us say if you have a PDL1 which is more than fifty percent. If you have a PDL1 more than 50%, as we can see over here, uh, uh, if you have a PDL1 which is more than 50%, you probably a single agent immunotherapy or if a low burden of disease or a single agent immunotherapy, if uh, immunochemo, if you have a high burden of disease, can be used. Uh, let's look at PDL1, 1 to 49%. That's a no brainer. You have to use a immunochemo combination. So there is no brainer. So a uh, PDL1 more than 50%, you will use low burden of disease, a single agent immunotherapy. High burden of disease, you will use a immunochemotherapy. PDL1 1 to 49%, you may use a, a chemo immuno combination. Now, what happens if you have a PDL1 0%? That's the most important thing. You can still go for a chemo immuno combination, but I'll be very tempted to use the IO IO combination plus uh, 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 the checkmate 9 in the combination, plus two cycles of chemotherapy, because I believe that is the subset with which your only immunotherapy is not going to act. So my conclusions, PDL1 more than 50%, high burden, embryo and chemo, low burden, embryo alone, PDL1 1 to 49, IO chemo, PDL1 less than 1%, IO, IO alone, or embryo uh, and chemotherapy, or IO, IO along with chemotherapy. In second line, you can give an immunotherapy with either nivolumab or atezolizumab, irrespective of the PDL one in wild type non small cell lung cancer. So, immunotherapy in non small cell lung cancer, we are, we are like an Indian cricket team. You know, we are happily spoiled for choices. 
uh, we have uh, rohit sharma we have pans we have ishan kishan there are lot of people who can actually fit in over there the audience feeling now probably right now is all is well but i will fail in my duties if i don't caution you regarding the cautions of using immunotherapy and i would like to say that all is not well also so again i spoke about this is our data of ega4 and pdl1 lot of time i get a call from my friend saying okay his pdl1 is 90% is also ega4 mutant what should i do friend do not treat them with immunotherapy or chemotherapy please go ahead and give them only targeted therapy because in our study we found out that there was no benefit of giving immunotherapy to a ega4 mutant individual this is a study which we all have seen uh, the durvalumab study after ctrt it's a fantastic study uh, that means uh, after giving the ctrt around 50% of people were alive at 4 years so should we give it to the egfr mutant individual also so if you have a non cancer lung cancer patient who has stage 3 lung cancer after dimetic chemo radiotherapy you should not give because people who have egfr mutated non cancer lung cancer they will not benefit from consolidation uh, durvalumab and you should never be given this is also some question which i get to be asked very very frequently uh we can also see uh, this is the the right one next way is a pre nevolumab hyper progression with immunotherapy is definitely a a, a fact and i have uh, scans to show it over here look at the scans that i have shown over there so immunotherapy is an absolutely fantastic thing but i like to end my story by saying the woods are lovely dark and deep but i have promises to keep and miles to go before we sleep for identifying the right strategy and the uh, right strategy for treating immunotherapy uh, patients with lung cancer with immunotherapy till then the word that i use for immunotherapy is cautious optimism uh, with this i thank you all and i hope at least 50% of you are awake uh, at the end of my lecture thank you and i'll no, be happy to i'm uh, i'm uh, uh, i just want to ask you some questions So, so that uh, why duvalumab in stage four lung cancer has done uh, worse? Uh, duvalumab uh, was a response. Why they tried duvalumab in stage three, not pembrolizumab or uh, nimolumab in stage three lung cancer? So, uh, why sir, they even... tried duvalumab? only on that part sir even the there are data with pembrolizumab pembrolizumab and nivolumab also uh, in stage three non small cell lung cancer it is only that the durvalumab data came first and they started the trial earlier so that is the only reason otherwise there is data of pembrolizumab with uh, immunotherapy in stage three also and the data with nivolumab and pembro both are positive so that's okay i mean we can go ahead but the approval is only for durvalumab right No, I, I know, I know, but I feel a bit controversy because stage four lung cancer development has done wrong, and yes, uh, somebody uh, they had tried in stage three and they approved it. That is my query. Secondly, yes, uh, another thing like uh, say, uh, how do you uh, when you start immunotherapy? Uh, they say that uh, you have a certain strong syndrome. Kind of syndrome. I didn't cytokine get you, sir. Cytokine, cytokine storm syndrome. Immunotherapy. Cytokine so, uh, storm syndrome. So, sir, I mean, so uh, this way. was a, so this was something right. which you were very scared earlier to when we started mm -hmm. giving, and we used to keep the patient for seven days in uh, uh, very close to our hospital. Uh, but now, sir, there is no cytokine storm that we see over here. Patients do have mm -hmm. immune-related adverse event like uh, autoimmune conditions. I did show you uh, patients of hyper progression over here, uh, but that occurs no, no, in less than five percent. No, point is uh, that can I? Sir, sorry to interrupt. Uh, can I start? Can uh, I start giving immunotherapy now in Guwahati? Why not, sir? If you have a fit patient, why not, sir? Sir, uh, I, I think uh, we are running short of time. Uh, sorry, sir. Take care. Sorry, sir. Uh, I think we'll have to wind on. Uh, I mean, move on to the next. Uh, Talk, sir. No, okay, okay, okay. Take care, take care, take care. We will yeah, take care. Simplified even uh, questions like. Sorry, me. sorry. Time concern is there. I'm sorry. I took your time. Um, yeah. Sorry. Sir, sorry. can you please introduce sorry. the next uh, speaker, Dr. Arvind Krishnamurthy? Mm -hmm. Oh, my doctor, Arvind. Arvind. 
and candy cam. Yeah. Yeah, we have the next talk by Dr. Arvind Krishnamurti, who is the professor of Adair Cancer Institute. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is my screen seen and am I audible, Kalan? Yes, sir. Very well, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure to give this talk uh, of the Association of North um, the mandate is to talk on mediastinal node sampling in carcinoma lung evidence versus practical approaches. Mediastinal staging in non-small cell can lung cancer is one of the most important in terms of prognostication. The five-year survival rate, in fact, decreases by 50% in the presence of a nodal involvement. It also has got certain implications in treatment. For example, if you have an N3 disease, more often than not, surgery is ruled out. If you have got an N2 disease, probably, the preference would be to give a non-surgical approach initially. And of course, N1 is something that you know we all surgeons would like to operate. Therefore, it's not just having an implication in treatment, but also having an impact on prognosis, mediastinal staging and accurately staging the mediastinum becomes that much more integral to the management of lung cancers. One must be aware of the mediastinal anatomy, the mediastinal zones that was elegantly described about uh, more than 25 years ago by Mountain Wrestler, divided into, into four zones, the supraclavicular, the upper, the AP window, subcarinal and lower zones, and also the hilar lymphadenopathy. So the understanding of the mediastinal anatomy is critical to understanding how we go about staging and managing these patients. If we go about the methods of mediastinal staging, PET-CT is the more commonly used. And nowadays, for all practical purposes, a majority of us tend to use this as a modality across stages. But mind you, it has a sensitivity of around 77%, specificity around 90 odd percent for mediastinal lymph node metastasis. Hence, it becomes important for us to stage the mediastinum by some methods, which is either minimally invasive, that is by the endoscopic approaches, or by the invasive approaches, that is by the media stenoscopy, and of course, there are other approaches also to go about. It's very important for us to understand when we do not do mediastinal staging, and this is when there is a negative PET in terms of lymph node involvement or a peripheral T1 lesion or a peripheral ground glass appearing or a semi-solid T2 lesion, wherein only if you do a PET CT, it would suffice, and there is no need to do either uh, invasive or a minimally invasive mediastinal staging. But for, for all practical purposes, apart from the uh, very advanced bulky mediastinal nodes, you don't really need to have any sort of a uh, for all other patients, you would have to do some sort of a mediastinal staging. For mediastinal staging, initially, the mediastinoscopy was considered to be the only gold standard. And I repeat here, the only gold standard because I believe that mediastinoscopy currently is also a relative gold standard against which all treatments have are compared. Several studies now have sort of compared combined EUS and EBUS with the original gold standard, that is the mediastinoscopy, and suggest that at least the EBUS TBNA is at least comparable, if not superior to mediastinoscopy. And this is the broad conclusions. I'm not really going through too much of evidence, but there are lots of evidences to this. And the evidences are that the sensitivity initially was reported to be very high in the ranges of 90 to 95 percent. But subsequently, over the years, there was a meta-analysis that said that the sensitivity may not be that high. In fact, ranges of around 45 to 97 percent with a median of around 89 percent. Again, the variability in the practice was because of the uncertainty of the technique, relatively small sample sizes, differences also to with, with the extent of prevalence and extent of the mediastinoscopy, the availability of the proper infrastructure and rapid on-site cytology and the sampling protocols. So there was a distinct variability of practices. And even now in a majority of the centers in India, although there may be an availability of the EUS and the EBUS facilities, how practically we do this for every patient of lung cancer needs to be determined. If you have an EBUS you would be able to sample some of these nodes, at least the levels 2 R and L, 4 R and L, 3 P, 7, and at times the 10 R and L. And nodes that you could not sample are the levels 3 A, 5, 8, and 9. However, if you combine the EUS with the EBUS and some of the institutions, they use the EUS scope, that is, the, or sorry, rather the EBUS scope, to go through the esophagus, almost all the lymph nodes in the mediastinum can be sampled. Even as there are prospective trials comparing US EBUS combined TBNA with mediastinoscopy, 
the real world evidence, at least the practice in the majority of the centers globally, seems to be that the US EBUS FNA approach has supplanted cervical metastroscopy as the preferred initial approach for the management of these tumors. Supposing you're able to get a positive yield by means of a minimally invasive staging by a EUS or EBUS, then you need not do a cervical metastroscopy. And this is just a, a pictorial representation of the nodes. This, all those sampled in green are the nodes that you can, you can actually sample by a EBUS and all those sampled in uh, in blue, you could actually sample them with, uh, uh, and uh, all those that are sampled with uh, LO is something that you would get only with an EUS. And remaining, you will be able to get by both the methods. As I said, if the EUS EBUS results are not definitive or not negative, majority of the guidelines say that you must do a confirmatory mediastinoscopy. There are three various approaches of doing a confirmatory mediastinoscopy. Either you do the standard cervical method or use VATS or a Chamberlain's method, but the more commonly one used one is the standard cervical mediastinoscopy. There are some evidences for extended cervical mediastinoscopy use of WAMLA, TEMLA, but I must say that these seems to be quite fancy, not being well validated, experiences limited, and you require real much of technical expertise in it. The ongoing trials are actually seeing whether we can actually omit mediastinoscopy provided you have a facility to do a good EUS and EBUS facility. So, as I said, when EUS or EBUS is negative, then you require a confirmatory mediastinoscopy, especially if you have a negative N2 or N3 node. But there are studies to sort of tell the ongoing study like the Mediast study, which says that, you know, can you omit a mediastinoscopy? But you can omit, at least in our real world practice, only if you have a robust facility of EUS and EBUS, and if you're able to do it successfully and have a robust program. Until then, I believe that if there is a technical expertise uh, or of having the US and EBUS facilities are not, are not able to do it, practicing a mediastinoscopy, at least a pre-staging mediastinoscopy, at least on the day of surgery, would sort of be a reasonable approach. And this is a practical tip for a real world in case you want to uh, follow some real world uh, practice and of good clinical practice. Again, when it comes to the surgical management for operable lung cancers, which is up to stage one to three, you would consider surgery in some form. I would want to reiterate, although the focus of the talk is predominantly on mediastinal staging and mediastinal sampling versus uh, mediastinal uh, lymph node dissection, this point is very important. The minimum surgery has to be a lobectomy. Uh, this is based on Ginsburg trial in 1995, 75% increase in recurrence rates, 30% increase in death, and 50% increases uh, in the death because of cancer if a sublobar resection was performed. So what is recommended is lobectomy with a systematic medicinal lymph node dissection in all low-risk operable cancers. Uh, although there are I must say, I must confess rather that there are four meta-analyses that have been reported saying that segmentectomy is as comparable as lobectomy, especially for stage one cancers. But in India, we practically hardly ever see some T1 cancers. Of course, some patients do come from the corporate checkup for screening, some defense people do have some screening mandated. We do get some odd lung cancers in the early stage, but for all practical purpose, we hardly get any T1 cancers. So my advice is for everybody, Considering the profile of tumors that we see even in early stage lung cancers, it would be preferable to do a formal anatomical lobectomy or pneumonectomy as the case might be, and then go for a lymph node dissection as mandated. When it comes to the evidence for lymph node dissection sampling versus a formal complete dissection, at least if you see by the evidences, from the purest evidences see that there are still controversies whether one is uh, better or not. Prior meta-analysis, and this is data about 15 years back, uh, even a Cochrane meta-analysis and review said that a mediastinal lymph node dissection clearly had a survival advantage when compared to a sampling approach. That is why the ESTS guidelines and the British Thoracic Society guidelines in 2005 and 2006 actually recommend strongly for the use of systematic lymph node dissection. Possibly this is because it reflected on increased accuracy of staging. 
However, what happened in the year 2011 is this uh, trial came, the Akazog Z11, and this trial actually brought in a lot of confusion in the picture. In this trial, all patients were initially subjected to very rigorous site-specific sampling of all the hilar and mediastinal lymph nodes. And the patients who were actually negative, these patients were subjected, about 1,011 patients of them were subjected or randomized rather to have either observation or a complete lymph node dissection. And incidentally, only 4% of the patients actually upstaged to N2. So this trial actually was a negative trial. And the authors concluded saying that mediastinal lymph node dissection did not improve the overall survival for patients as compared to mediastinal lymph node sampling. And this was also brought about in a meta-analysis subsequently, Huang's meta-analysis in 2014, of six randomized trial, controlled trials with around 70, 90 patients, 50% each in both the arms, which saying that there's no significant difference over the mediastinal lymph node dissection uh, versus mediastinal lymph node sampling. Other rates were more or less similar between the two groups. So there was a group that says, but this there, the, there were a lot of limitations of this meta-analysis. As I said, even the Akazog Z013 uh, trial, there had some flaws in that in the sense like no, there was a very rigorous sampling actually done in the arm that was actually sampled. So not all the trials would be able to match to the levels of standards of sampling that the authors of the study did. And that is why possibly they did not have an overall survival advantage. If you see the more recent evidences, they suggest that the recurrence rates in the mediastinum would be much higher in the patients who actually had a sampling, that is a lobe-specific nodal dissection, than in patients who had a uh, system, uh, systematic lymph node dissection. And there is also a concept of skip metastasis. That is, without the N1 nodes, you could have an N2 uh, disease. And that's why a lot of expert evidences strongly recommend to go for a systematic lymph node dissection for almost all patients of staging for early lung cancers, operable lung cancers. They say that at least three stations, and I feel that this is a reasonable, the uh, ESTS guidelines has come with a reasonable recommendation, at least three and two stations, at least a minimum of six nodes. And this is something I, I feel every thoracic surgeon should be able to achieve, if not to come have an, a more exhaustive, although some other authors say that you could actually have up to 11 to 14 nodes and at least five stations. This is probably a slightly higher benchmark, but I feel that any thoracic surgeon who is embarking on lung surgery, the minimum, as I said, for the Indian subcontinent would be to do a formal anatomical lobectomy and at least sam uh, do a systematic lymph node dissection, at least have six amount of lymph nodes to call it a pathological N0 status. It's very important because nowadays surgeon is the prognostic factor in many solid tumors, which we have seen lung being no important. And this was a very wonderful landmark paper, which I thought I would share with you all, published in the thick of the pandemic uh, last year. With regards to benchmarking for lung cancer surgery, of obviously high surgical volumes, better are the outcomes. Uh, three things that a surgeon who is practicing lung cancers need to achieve. A negative margin, and there is a 50% reduction in death once you achieve a negative margin. If you do a good systematic lymph node dissection, your chances of bettering the outcomes is about 25 to 30%. And if you do a formal anatomical or a low bar resection, then again, 50% reduction in death. So my advice to every thoracic surgeon is to do a good formal anatomical res resection, to have a reasonable amount of lymph nodes harvested by doing a systematic mediastinal lymph node dissection, and more importantly, to achieve a negative margin of resection. So we are in the, in the era of surgical minimalism. Uh, there are evolving data to suggest that possibly instead of having a more invasive approach to lung cancers, you could do away with something lesser called the systematic uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy. But I must say this concept is a very attractive and evolving concept. I just wanted to throw this concept to, it's, a, uh, it's not standard of care by no means, but it is something which is futuristic for the youngsters to see and imbibe. There are encouraging results with the use of NIR and the ICG techniques and possibly Till uh, we get encouraging results from this technique, we'll have to wait. But otherwise, I think it's preferable for early stage operable lung cancers to do a formal anatomical lobectomy, a systematic lymph node dissection with a negative margin. And that gives our surgeon, the patient, the best chance of cure. Of course, obviously, there are issues with uh, you must add adjuvant chemotherapy or immunotherapies, as was uh, said in, in, uh, in cases that is appropriate. Thank you very much for the attention.
Thank you for a nice presentation. Uh, I recommend at least uh, three uh, stations. Uh, at least not three stations. At least three stations will be participated. Absolutely, sir. Nice presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I once again thank the organizers, uh, Caleb Vikas, and, all, and the entire uh, leadership of AONI for giving me this opportunity to share some of my perspectives with regards to that. Nice uh, having you. And I recommend that this three sessions should be covered. Right, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Dr. Saikya, and thank you, Dr. Arvind Krishnamurti, for the talk. And with that, we'll move to the next session. Uh, I invite uh, Dr. Devaprata Varman, uh, who is the head of Gynae Oncology at um, the Fever Work Cancer Institute to chair the session. And Dr. Nirpendra, Dr. Nirpendra, uh, Dr. Nirpendra is a radiation oncologist at uh, Imphal in Manipur. Welcome, uh, please take over the session. Hello. Uh, why in mask? Why in mask? Are you alone? Or are you... Uh, so, sir, we are having a conference right now in Manipur. I'm in the middle of the conference. That's why uh, I'm in guest out here. But anyway, sir, uh, we can start our session. The first, uh, I'm, I, I invite, sir, Dr. SB, SBS Dio. Uh, Uncle Sarazen from Ames, New Delhi. He will be talking on role of HEPAC in cytoreductive surgery, a current status. Hello. Yes, am I audible? Yes, please, please continue. Uh, yeah, can you see my slides, Kale? Uh, sir, we are not seeing your slides, sir. Uh... I am trying to share them actually. Yeah, uh, just uh, can you just close the sharing and uh, uh, try st uh, sharing again? Yes, yeah. sir. We are seeing your slides. Please make it full screen, sir. And... Fine. Thank you. Got it? Yes, sir. Perfect. Please talk, sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank the Northeast Oncology Association for giving me this uh, fantastic opportunity. Uh, many thanks to Dr. Caleb and Dr. Vika. Uh, I have been asked to cover uh, the role of cytoreductive surgery in high tech for peritoneal surface malignancies. So in the next 15 minutes, I'll just give you an overview and current status of uh, high tech in peritoneal surface malignancies. Uh, you see, peritoneal surface malignancies is a relatively new term. It is not a new tumor, but it includes a heterogeneous group of tumors, mainly spreading along the peritoneal surfaces without deep invasion. So uh, in the peritoneal surface malignancies, we include primary peritoneal tumors, uh, including mesothelioma, carcinomatosis, and sarcomatosis. And we have a set of tumors that spread to, through peritoneum that includes appendicular tumors, ovarian cancers, colorectal cancers, gastric cancers, and other visceral cancers. Traditionally, peritoneal surface malignancies are considered incurable stage four disease, but a lot of things have changed in the last two decades. Uh, recent advances in better understanding of biology, change in treatment philosophy, and advances in therapy. Currently, PSM are considered a treatable and they are a regional manifestation of disease. And there is a paradigm shift in the management approach, which used to be purely palliative uh, around 10 years back to a potentially curative approach in a subset of PSM patients, not all peritoneal surface malignancies, but some group of patients do benefit. So the, what is special about peritoneal surface malignancy, the pattern of spread, you must understand, most of the solid tumors are spread by local spread, lymphatic spread, and lymphogenous spread. Where are the peritoneal surface tumors they spread through transcelomic spread along the surfaces of the peritoneum, and translymphatic spread, and a lot of fluid and gravity determine what kind of metastasis they develop. So you see there are dynamics within the peritoneal cavity, depending on the peristalsis, the fluid current, gravity, patient position, primary site of the tumor, there will be tumor redistribution and non-random and biomechanical phenomena that leads to development of peritoneal metastasis. The most common sites of peritoneal metastasis are pelvis and paracolic gutters because there are dependent sites. And lymphatic spread 
can also happen to the greater momentum, inferior surface of the diaphragm, falciform ligament, Douglas pouch, and small bowel mesentery. So you must be very familiar with the entire anatomy of the peritoneum if you want to start a high pack program. So these are the common sites you can see here, the common routes of spread of peritoneal surface malignancy, the upper abdominal, you can see the lesser sac, gallbladder, subdiaphragmatic area, and on the right side, which is the pelvic peritoneum, the entire covering of the bladder, uterus is all studded with peritoneal disease. So there were three things which have happened in the last 15 years. I will just briefly mention the cytorelective surgery, which is not a new sort of approach. This has been tried since 1930. Its uh, name was proposed by Meigs uh, for ovarian cancer in 1930. So they have been doing cytorelective surgery, debulking surgery or palliative surgery with a modest outcome with a high mobility and mortality. But the major breakthrough came in 1995 when the proper peritonectomy was described by Paul Sugar Baker. Coming to chemotherapy for peritoneal surface malignancies, it was not been effective because we have been trying systemic therapy because the plasma peritoneal barrier will not allow the drugs to enter the peritoneal tumor nodules in an effective manner. Then they started trying intraperitoneal chemotherapy, that's called IP chemotherapy, uh, which was had a modest success, but not uh, routinely used because of various toxicity issues, technical issues. The third concept was hyperthermia, which has been known to treat cancer uh, for the last 20, 30 years. In experimental studies, it has been shown that temperatures above 40 degrees can be tumoricidal. So when they combine hyperthermia with intraperitoneal chemotherapy, what has happened, there is a direct cytotoxic effect on the, uh, with the leading to DNA damage. There is a heat synergizes chemotherapeutic drug cytotoxic effect. There's a greater penetration of chemotherapy into tumors. There is increased cell membrane permeability, increased drug concentration. So they are getting the benefit of both hyperthermia and chemotherapy with a synergistic effect. So that is what has actually led to the unified approach of management of peritoneal surface malignancies, where the gross of macroscopic disease is taken care by surgery, that is cytorelective surgery, and the microscopic disease is handled using high-tech, hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy. So these two approaches have led to a better outcomes. Uh, if you look at the evolution of uh, cytorelective surgery in high -tech, uh, the efforts have been done since 1970, but its progress has been very slow because it's a very major and complex treatment with a lot of morbidities. So now, but we have a very good outcome with a lot of randomized trials coming in the last 10 years. So who are the pa uh, patients who are actually taken up for CRS and high -tech? Patient selection is extremely important. Not all peritoneal surface malignancy patients are suitable for high -tech. The performance status, biology of the tumor, absence of extra abdominal disease, absence of parenchyma and liver mats or retroperitoneal nodes, and optimal CRS should be feasible. That means the residual lesion should not cross 2.5 millimeter. And there should be a systemic therapy or a chemotherapy backup. The tumor should be chemosensitive. So what are the major components of peritonectomy? It has got a parietal peritonectomy and visceral peritonectomy, which includes a total omentectomy, anterior and lateral parietal peritonectomy, pelvic peritonectomy, subdiaphragmatic peritonectomy, removal of falciform and gastropathic ligament, and parts of mesentery. We also do a visceral peritonectomy, which includes organ removal, including splenectomy, gallbladder, recursive bird removal, uterus and ovary, appendix, small intestine, and colon. So this is various components of peritonectomy include these procedures. So this is how we can approach for peritonectomy. So we have either an extra peritoneal approach, which is called a parachute approach. We strip the entire peritoneum. And uh, once you complete your parietal peritonectomy, you proceed with the visceral peritonectomies. So you see here the diaphragmatic peritoneum is stripped. You also need to strip the glissons capsule of the liver. This is all surface metastasis. So there are, uh, and you must also understand what is peritoneal carcinomatosis index. So there is a scoring system which will show the severity of the disease and the burden of disease of peritoneal disease. So the abdomen is divided into 13 quarters and you give a score. So the PCI score indicates the severity of peritoneal carcinomatosis. The higher the score, uh, the outcomes are not going to be good. So you should be able to score the peritoneal disease as soon as you do a laparotomy. Uh, the other score you must all be familiar with is optimal cytoreduction score, completeness of cytoreduction. This is called CC scoring. So once you do a surgical cytoreduction, if there is no gross disease, it's called CC zero. 
If there is residual disease with the individual tumor less than 2.5 millimeters, it's called CC1. So CC0 and CC1 are the optimal sort of a situations where HIPEC will be useful. If you're not able to cytoreduce, and if the CC scores are three and four, then HIPEC utility is questionable. So hyperthermic intrapetone chemotherapy is basically an intraoperative direct delivery of heated chemotherapy to the abdominal cavity after surgical cytoreduction using a special machine. I will just show you the components of HIPEC. Uh, this basically the principle is there is a heat exchanger, there is a pump, so there is a circuit which you establish with the machine into the abdominal cavity, and there is an inlet, there is an outlet. So there is a perfusion which takes place uh, in which the temperature is maintained uh, around 41 to 42 degrees. And uh, this is all the closed circuit and you can add chemotherapy. This is how the machine looks like on the right side. You can see this is a high-tech machine. This is what we use at our center. There are different techniques of high -tech. We have an open technique, we have a closed technique. I will show you how it is done. You see the, on the left side, it is called an open technique where you create a coliseum sort of thing. A abdominal cavity is created and you put the uh, hyperthermic intrapetal chemotherapy within the abdominal cavity. And uh, there is a closed system where you close the entire abdomen and put the inlet and outlet and start the hyper, just called a closed. What we use is uh, on the right side, you can see it is a semi-open technique. We open a small window but this, called, uh, this will give a good access to the abdominal cavity. And you can also uh, take all the safety precautions which are uh, accompanied by a closed technique of hyper. Choice of chemotherapy, mostly the common agents we use are mitomycin, cisplatin, oxaliplatin. And you should be familiar with the nomenclatures like bidirectional chemotherapy, which means it's a intraperitoneal as well as systemic. EPIC means early postoperative intraperitoneal chemotherapy. We do HIPEC followed by EPIC. NIPS means new adjuvant intraperitoneal and systemic chemotherapy. And the ideal temperature normally we use is 41 to 43 degrees and duration of HIPEC is 60 to 90 minutes. Now I'll just briefly highlight what are the evidence and the current indications for HIPEC. This is the systematic uh, review recently published in 2020 in European Journal of Cancer. The current indications of HIPEC include the carcinoma appendix with pseudomyxoma peritoneum, Malignant peritoneal mesotheliomas. These two are, are uh, I think we have the best outcomes. Colorectal cancer with isolated or limited peritoneal metastasis. Ovarian cancer is again another potential sort of a malignancy which can be tackled with TRS and HIPEC, which can be done in the primary setting, interval cytoreduction, or in the current patients following secondary cytoreduction. Gastric cancer, of course, there are certain literature coming from Japan using HIPEC, and peritoneal sarcomatosis, uh, HIPEC has also been tried, but not with very good outcomes. So for pseudomyxoma peritoneum, currently HIPEC, TRS and HIPEC is the standard of care. We have plenty of literature. So these are the uh, big studies which I've quoted here. So now it is considered standard of care. For malignant peritoneal mesothelioma also, it is considered standard of care in peritonectomy followed by HIPEC. Colorectal cancers, there is level one evidence. We have randomized controlled trials, but you must remember the patient selection is very important. PCI should not be more than 12. There should be isolated peritoneal mats. Uh, then HIPEC and CRS is going to be beneficial. Gastric cancer, most of the studies are coming from France, Germany, and Japan. And they also have shown an improvement in patients, especially who, who can be a where you can achieve CC0 or 1. There are no distant metastasis. Non-signet ring cell histology is very, very important in gastric cancers. If there is a signet ring cell type of cancer, they are very aggressive. So HIPEC is not going to be beneficial. Ovarian cancers, we have again level 1 evidence available for interval, for upfront, as well as following secondary cytoreduction. We can add HIPEC uh, with good outcomes. Peritoneal sarcomatosis, limited experience. So I would not uh, advise uh, people who are starting HIPEC to start with these kind of cases. Coming to the, uh, to the complexity of the procedure, CRS and HIPEC is a complex multidisciplinary therapeutic intervention. It is skill, capital, and resource intensive. You need a lot of skills, you need a lot of capital investments and a lot of resources for a good HIPEC program. 
what are the optimal requirements it should be done in tertiary care hospital setups with uh, multi modality teams a good operation theater setup machinery and equipment availability should be there and uh, we should have standard operating guidelines and protocols the kind of hospitals where you should venture for hypec include a tertiary care multi specialty hospital there should be a backup of other medical specialties comprehensive oncology facilities it should be done in high volume referral centers and you should also have good supportive services including critical care icu blood bank and rehabilitation it's a team work hypec and crs is not a one man job you need to develop oncology teams surgical teams ancillary and supportive teams they all play a very important role ot safety protocols operation theater protocols are extremely important because there is a risk of chemo aerosol and surgical fume inhalation so personal protective equipment during hypec is very important which includes high power filtration masks goggles we wear double gloves impervious zones and overshoe covers so this is how the setup looks like for a hypec safety precautions are extremely important so coming to uh, just before i end my talk uh, this is our own experience at aims new delhi we started uh, with the uh, basic work starting from 2013 14 we started doing hypex the machines were not available at that time uh, we could establish the protocol and set up a good uh, program by 2016 so now we have done almost 250 hypex for various indications so uh, but uh, all the protocols multidisciplinary approach are very very important so this is our uh, own experience there is a learning curve in hypex so here we have compared our outcomes in the first 75 and second 75 patients and uh, a good morbidity mortality could be achieved uh, to, like international benchmarks in the first 70 cases itself so a lot of experience is needed a good protocols multi modality approach and the high quality benchmarks should be there for a good program and if you look at our indications uh, our patients in our series at aims new delhi ovarian cancer colorectal cancer uh, appendicular cancer pseudomyxoma mesothelioma and others these are the most common tumors we have done uh, high pec in our setup and we could achieve cc0 score in almost 90% of the patients and the pci rates are also documented here and uh, the duration of surgery normally takes anywhere between 6 to 7 hours for each uh, certain equipment hypex the average icu stays around 1 to 2 days and uh, if you see the hospital stay currently it is like any other major surgery in our setup because we have standardized most of the uh, process for hypex uh coming to uh, just to summarize my talk crs and hypex is a promising modality for a subset of patients with peritoneal surface malignancy just remember this it should not be offered to all the patients indication should be very clear patient assessment and which patient is going to benefit you have to offer to only that subset the key to success is a systematic protocol protocol based approach it should be a team approach patient selection is important prehabilitation especially the nutritional prehabilitation respiratory uh, pulmonary prehabilitation are extremely important very operative care protocol should be standardized and surgical protocol should be you should have a team of surgeons who normally work as a two or three teams so one team operates for 2 to 3 hours then the other team takes over everybody is trained ot safety protocols are extremely important and uh, we should have a standard chemotherapy protocols depending on the type of tumor you are dealing with we should develop these in collaboration with medical oncology and uh, documentation and database are extremely important last but not the least is the research component for ipec and crs thank you very much Thank you, sir. I'm Dr. Barman from Biboro Cancer Institute from the Gynae Oncology Department. Yeah, thank you, sir. It was really a very wonderful talk, and it is always uh, great to hear from you. So I would like to open the session for uh, questions. We can, uh, Dr. Kelly, was just inform me. We have some time to take few questions. So I would like to request all the participants uh, or delegates to ask your query. Whether we should. Ask a machine system uh, with capox or petricarbo. Oh, uh, you are asking for high pex, sir? Machine carcinomas? No, no, no. I am asking for a machine carcinoma ovary. Hmm. Mm hmm. 
whether we should first line we should do practicable or a box and discuss. You're talking about systemic therapy, maybe. Actually, no. sir, I think we are discussing high here. So, uh, for the sorry. high pack mm -hmm. protocol is uh, cisplatin for these tumors, uh, mm -hmm. the first line. And uh, second line, we have used uh, taxes also. Around. Oxaliplatin has been used. But oxaliplatin has got certain issues, uh, including bleeding. Uh, the Prodigy trial has also shown the outcomes are not uh, as comparable to cisplatin. So our first choice is cisplatin. Second choice is uh, mitobacin. Sometimes to go for mitobacin. Sir, uh, this is Caleb here. One question. So considering yes. that, uh, I, uh, to the best of my knowledge, none of the centers in Northeast are currently offering uh, HIPEC. So if we have to refer a patient to for uh, uh, HIPEC, it means that the patient has to travel outside the Northeast and probably uh, the patient has to sell a lot of property and uh, come and get treated. So which are the patients? For example, in ovary, you listed a long list, but uh, say what is what are the patients for whom you should surely uh, refer uh, that kind of, for example, LAMN is one indication. Absolutely, I know. absolutely. absolutely Karib. That's a very valid point. That's what I always tell. Uh, CRS and HIPEC is not for every peritoneal substance malignancy patient. So we always, the patient selection is very important. I think the, the best, I think the maximum benefit you see is to uh, low to moderate grade appendicular tumors with pseudomyxomas. The outcomes are excellent. Uh, mesotheliomas, especially non sarcomatoid type of mesotheliomas. So they also respond very well uh, to the coming to ovary, uh, recurrent platinum resistant cases are not very good for. CRS and HIPEC. We normally don't push these patients, especially recurrent ovarian cancer, failing first line, second line, third line, and platinum resistant tumors also. The best outcomes, I would say, would be with the interval uh, site reduction uh, along with HIPEC and ovarian cancer. Gastric cancer, we are not advising routine HIPEX for gastric cancer because the biology is totally different. Colorectal, I think a small subset of patients with pure peritoneal metastasis, PCI less than 12, I think that is the group which is going to benefit with high tech. I think the selection is very important. I think your question is very, 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 very valid. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So regarding the various techniques, open, closed, semi-closed, which one you are following at ease? Uh, Dr. Barman, we are doing a semi-open technique. So what semi -open. we have shown a picture. So we use a uh, book water detectors here, or we use our... Uh, 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 we sort of a 3M uh, film, we use it and make a small hole in the center uh, with a yeah. steady ray through which you can monitor the bowel contents. We can also agitate the fluid while during high pack. We want a good distribution because sometimes what happens is the circulation is not good. Uh, the temperature pockets will be localized to certain parts of the peritoneal cavity. Yeah, yeah. We keep that window for monitoring uh, the perfusion and to make sure that the circulation is good. And we also keep changing the table position uh, into head up, head low, and lateral okay. position so that hmm. the perfusion is uniform uh, throughout the abdomen. Okay. Dr. Borman, yes, I have a question to you. Question yes, sir. Yes, sir. When please, are you please. bringing this facility to BBCI? BBCI is you know, progressing very fast, acquiring a lot of facilities. This facility, yeah. we had been at, uh, you know, asking about, talking about a uh, uh, long, yes. long time. So when are yes. you thinking about it? I think no, you I have think to take the leadership for the Northeast yeah. patients. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Deo is there. Dr. Deo is there always. To program. Help you. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, take uh, it up with your administration. Happy to get it as yeah. soon as possible. As a but project, then, I think this is that as Sarah has already told, it has involves a lot of cost to the patient also. Even if in the government setup, I don't know, sir. But what is the expenditure that is incurred in AIMS? You see, what, uh, you see, our uh, machine is procured by the hospital. So that is one-time hmm. investment. Okay. okay. This is government expenditure. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, that is okay. This is government yeah. expenditure. Maybe say also, no problem. It, like it is one-time investment. What is, I think, the most uh, costly part, If you, but it is still cheaper than the targeted therapies and second, third line chemo. Yes, of course. The, yeah, yes, yeah. of course. Yes, uh, sir. The, yeah, the disposable HIPEX set. Yes. That cost is around one lakh. It is single-use tubing system. With a heat exchanger that costs around one lakh, so that is the only thing patient has to buy because drugs are very cheap. These are very common drugs. Drugs like is very yes, yes. Very, very, yes. Very, 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 very cheap. I'm sure yeah. this is cheaper than mostly fancy targeted therapy, Absolutely. immunotherapy, yes. and all. Absolutely. So Absolutely. I think this facility <clears throat> must come to notice 
and Absolutely. BBC should take the leadership. Yes, sir. We should try our best, Absolutely. yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hello. Hello. Am I audible? Yes. Hello. Yeah. Uh, sir, yeah. sir, please start in BBC. I would and like once to... it is... Uh, sir, please start in BBC and sir, yeah, once yeah, it is, we, we started start. in BBC, sir, please inform us so that the other peripheral uh, like uh, states from uh, notice can come and uh, learn yes, from sir. you and then sir, we can start in other states. Sir. Yeah, yeah, Dr. yeah. Parman, we can actually have a collaborative program if you want, we can yes. you in Yes, sir, yes, sir. Actually, Dr. Jaydeep, yeah, Jaydeep was project. in touch with you, he sure. also told me he's also interested, so maybe sure. we'll start very soon. Sure, sure. Yes, Another thing, sir, your uh, uh, average sure. hospital... Yeah. Uh, you're, yeah. You're, I have seen your uh, yeah. in the presentation. You have told your average hospital stay is around eight to nine days. Yes. Yes. So uh, yeah. now the, that era has come in all the oncology field. So yes. are uh, uh, are you advocating that in Hypec also? Yes, absolutely, absolutely, Dr. Burman. All our uh, prehabilitation, perioperative care, and postoperative protocols are uh, uh, according to era. That is why yeah. you are able to discharge our patients. It's like any other major surgery now. Yeah. Like a gastrectomy and like that. It is not yeah, yeah. part of the case. So, yeah. so we are able to discharge them in seven to eight days. Yeah, yeah. One last uh, question from question me. to Dev, sir. Yes. Okay, after yeah, okay. please. Yeah, sir. Uh, in a like in a periphery, in a periphery where I'm working, like uh, I do it uh, CRS. After that, I try to give a lot of uh, extensive lavas. Yeah, uh, uh, that's my uh, like. Oh, how much does it work like for uh, periphery where there is no high peg? Yeah. Uh, you see, intraperitoneal chemotherapy is an option. If you don't have a high peg machine, IP chemotherapy is an option. Uh, the technique is clearly described. You can leave. Uh, you can do a lavage, leave uh, abdominal drains, and perioperatively you can do uh, uh, intraperitoneal chemotherapy. Early. That is sir. Epic. That's normothermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. So that uh, that Dr. I can. Barman, I think. Dr. Yes, Dr. Barman, sir. Yes, sir. Excuse me. I have another session uh, to start. Yes, sir. Start yes, sir. <laughs> Uh, it, it is always our pleasure to keep you as much as possible. No, so, but then, no, sorry. No, <laughs> yeah, sir. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So now, uh, can we call upon Dr. Sandeep Taparia? As he will be talking on nuclear medicine in the treatment of malignancy, a therapeutic aspect. Yeah, hello, I'm, am I audible? Yes. Yes, yes Sandeep, yes. please go on. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, uh, Caleb, can you load the slides? Yeah, uh, can the uh, slides be uh, shared, please? Just one minute, uh, Dr. Sandeep. Yes, sir, I'm sharing the slides, sir. Hello. So good evening, everyone. Today, I'm going to speak uh, about therapeutic aspect of nuclear medicine. So we know that uh, it's nuclear medicine is not all about uh, PET CT scan or any scan, bone scan, thyroid scan. We have some role in therapeutic aspect also. And today, I'm just going to highlight a few, uh, few of them. Yeah. So coming to the point, theranostics. Theranostics uh, is a term coined with the uh, like therapeutic aspect and the diagnostic aspect. So in theranostics, what we do, we uh, image a tumor of uh, with a certain targets like uh, any receptor target, like EG, if we are EGFR or uh, or HER2 new or PSMA, and we identify the targets and we treat only the tar target. So this is a targeted therapy. And theranostic is will image, image that receptor and will treat that receptor. So now, radio, radionucleides, what are the various uh, radionucleides we use? Uh, radionuclide can be an alpha, alpha emitter or it can be a beta emitter. So alpha emitter advantage is ra its range is uh, less. So side, side effect. Chop, 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 chop. 
side side effect is uh, le less it, it is more, tar more targeted samo and uh, beta emitter uh, it is it is advantage is that it, it is a legal range is longer and it has a crossfire effect so now coming to the bread and butter like uh, which are most of us knows uh, radio iodine i'm not going to speak in detail about radio iodine but i, I just want to touch a few points so what uh, what is the principle of uh, using radio iodine radio iodine uh, we have a sodium iodide symport and sodium iodide symporter which is located in the thyroid follicular cell it is up up regulated in thyroid cancer cancer and uh, through the same mechanism in which normal iodine goes radio iodine also goes uh, enter inside the follicular cell and goes to the colloid and it stays there and it uh, causes a local destruction of the thyroid cells so now this we see after doing a thyroid surgery in a thyroid cancer total thyroidectomy uh, so the patient will see uh, this kind of whole body iodine scan on the extreme left so we can see the remnant we can see the nodal metastasis and uh, in the the middle image we see that there is a diffuse there is a, there is a diffuse uh, uh, uptake in both the both the lungs that is a picture of uh, micro metastasis in the lung and uh, we we can see that if uh, total if the total thyroidectomy is not not done starburst uh, starburst effect can be seen in the thyroid bed so it is uh, Uh, like a thyroid staging is a post operative staging so whatever uh, so this scan also acts as a staging scan now what are the uh, goals like this uh, few terms are very confusing uh, what is remnant ab ablation what is adjuvant therapy and what is radio iodine therapy in remnant ablation uh, there uh, we do not sus there, there is no suspicious residual disease it's only uh it's the it have two goals one to kill the thyroid cells whatever are left so that the, there is a future follow up of the, with the tg is more accurate and it also act as initial staging so adjuvant like if if uh, perioperative or post operative you find that the, 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 there is a suspicion of some unproven metastasis then uh, the we use the term adjuvant therapy or if if there is proven metastasis then the term radio iodine therapy is used so now coming who not to ablate so like uh, there are uh, ata guidelines is around nearly about 180 or 190 pages but like uh, there is a lot of confusion about all this is but i will highlight who not to ablate like the patient uh, low risk the differentiated thyroid uh, the cancer or unifocal micro papillary cancer thyroid or multifocal micro papillary cancer thyroid they these patient do not need ablation uh, and uh, uh, risk stratification according to the at guidelines are like low risk intermediate risk and high risk so there is a long uh, part so now so what is the survival benefit like if we do it is a article which is published in clinical journal of uh, endocrinology and metabolism we see that uh, they have used the 3m one arm they have only done a surgery a second arm they have done surgery with suppressive dose of uh, eltroxin and third uh, they have given uh, surgery with uh, uh, a suppressive dose of eltroxin and radio iodine ablation so in we, we can see that uh, there is a percentage of uh, local recurrence and distant recurrence both are less if you use radio iodine so now what a take home message like use of uh, we we have to use ata risk stratification uh, and uh, with a patient with the low risk uh, differential thyroid cancer or unifocal micro micro ptc or multifocal micro ptc they do not need uh, ablation ablation is only for intermediate and high risk now as per guidelines low risk uh, low risk uh, like low dose 30 mg is used preferred over 100 mg but if there is nodes and uh, no, nodal nodal disease is there then somewhere between 75 to 150 millikiri is used now next coming to the uh, prostate cancer so prostate cancer we have a lot of upcoming role in prostate cancer so coming to the slide like prostate cancer initially it is a localized disease so local treatment and the patient is castration sensitive 
So patient is going to do initially fine, but once the patient goes into the resistance phase, so there are there are treatment options, but uh, eventually the patient will progress. So like uh, in those those cases, like we have we can image uh, prostate specific uh, membrane PSMA receptor. So now. So prostate specific membrane antigen, it is a like surface glycoprotein and uh, the fun its function is not clear, but it's uh, main, uh, it is internalized by, by endocytosis in the prostate cells. So now we, we use mainly gallium PSMA 11 for this gallium, uh, PSMA is a ligand and we, with the help of a chelator, it is uh, labeled to the ra radioisotope. So it is a gallium PSMA 11 scan and I will come to the this scan. Uh, this is a germanium gallium generator like FDG. There is a, you know, this uh, gallium can be produced in-house. So like patient can come in drop down anytime and anytime this gallium scan can, can be done because the production is in-house. This, uh, the, with the help of gener generator, we get gallium and gallium is uh, put into the vial which has a PSMA and it is labeled and then we do the do a scan. This is a PSMA scan. We can see that uh, the disease is in prostate and uh, pelvic nodes and retroperitoneal nodes and the, it has a physiological distribution in both the kidneys and salivary glands and mild uptake in liver and spleen also there. So molecular imaging, we have various targets like uh, osteotropic or oncotropic, like uh, bone scan, they do not target the tumor cells. Bone scan target the surrounded osteo osteoblastic activity, which is caused by the tumor cells. But uh, FDG and PSMA, they, uh, they go into the tumor cells. So these are oncotropic radioisotopes. So PSMA therapy is uh, as now presently it is used as the last, last therapeutic option. So PSMA actually, uh, there are no large studies. Most of the studies are like uh, in a, uh, in a short, short community and there we need a longer uh, like uh, studies with more number of subjects. But like in this case, uh, India is leading and uh, AIMS Delhi, they have, they have done a lot of PSMA therapy and they have, uh, they will be coming soon coming out with their own very big data. So like the, we can image the PSM, the, this uh, prostate cancer with gallium and we, we can treat with lutetium. So, so this is the article we can see that in the lutetium 160, uh, 177 lutetium PSMA. So this article is a recent article published in 2021 this year. So like uh, it is published in Curious and it, it shows that it is a viable, effective uh, treatment in a patient who has pro in a progressive uh, metastatic CRPC patients. So overall survival, what is the overall survival benefit? This is an article which is public in, uh, published in Euro European Journal of Nuclear Medicine. And it shows that there is an over overall survival benefit of uh, 32 months. So we can see that there are two arms. One, uh, the one of the one arm, the patient uh, they show initial decline of PSMA, uh, PSA, and one arm which do not show initial decline after PSA. So the patient, the arm which shows initial de decline of PSA after the first cycle of uh, PSMA therapy, so they their overall survival is 52 weeks. And uh, I'm talking about survival because most of the patients they are heavily treated and. Uh, they are treated uh, with most most of the targeted most of the therapies and still they are progressing so this is the last line therapy for them and choosing and most of the patients were in ecog 2 or 3 so choosing those set of patients and giving 32 weeks of survivability i think uh, it it is uh, like commendable so this is a case report so we can see that uh, uh, what how how can targeted therapy benefit the patient like initially PSMA was around 1200. So after giving four cycles, like we give one cycle, we give around uh, 150 to 200 millicurie. So after giving four cycles of uh, this, uh, the PSA has come, come down drastically. 
So this is kind of response uh, you get in a targeted therapy using PSMA. So conclusion is that about 70 to 80% patient with metastatic CRPC, they do well respond to radio ligand therapy. And the patient who has initial decline of PSA shows a low, longer overall survivability. Still we need large, larger studies and uh, this all uh, studies and data have to be incorporated into the guidelines. Then only this th therapy will come up in a big way. Maybe in coming future or next one to two years, we'll have uh, these things will be incorporated in most of the guidelines. So in neuroendocrine mal malignancies, so neuroendocrine tumors are a heterogeneous, heterogeneous group of tumors. So So uh, it can arise from various various cells uh, like various glands, like PTT, parathyroid, adrenal, or thyroid, or GP, just gastroenteropancreatic neuro, uh, neuroendocrine tumors, like insulinoma, glucagonoma, somatostenoma. So the various types can be there. Uh, and uh, this mainly they have various types of neuroendocrine tumors have various kind, types of receptors. So... So we can see that the, the, there are somatostatin receptors and various uh, like uh, EG, EGFR uh, receptor, PDF, little germ growth factors, and various other research receptors are uh, expressed in the neuroendocrine tumor depending on the type of tumor. So we can see that these are the various receptors can be expressed in neuroendocrine tumor. And most common, uh, this uh, tumor receptor is somatostatin receptor. So the somatostatin receptors are from uh, uh, one to five. So, like most of the most of the tumors so express somatostatin receptor two, 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 three, and five. So two is a, two is the most commonly uh, which is somatostatin receptor two is expressed in neuroendocrine tumor. So what is the role of uh, like uh, nuclear medicine? We have, we can like, similarly, we can scan and we can treat. We can be scanned by using gallium, gallium, dota, 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 we treat by using lutetium, dota. So like, uh, in, uh, this is a principle, how the, this therapy works. Like in somatostatin receptor, uh, we have a ligand and this ligand is tagged with uh, radioactive uh, isotope. In this case, it is lutetium 177 and this uh, isotope is internalized in, 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 into the cell and it causes local destruction and uh, damage to the DNA. So what is the uh, efficacy and overall survival? So like uh, using lutetium dotatate, so overall progression-free survival uh, the, they say in various studies ranges from various but average it is like around 30, 30 months and overall survival is around uh, 40 to 50, 50 months. What are the treatment options? Initially, if it is a localized tumor, surgery is the first line of treatment. And if, if after surgery, the small residual is there like uh, somatostatin analogs, like sendostatin, all this, these are octotide, lentotide, this all treatment is started, but like eventually if the patient uh, becomes uh, progression, the patient shows progression on those drugs, then PRRNT, it's like the peptide receptor radionuclide therapy is used. So well differentiated tumor for somatostatin analog or interferon, if it is uh, progressive, then systemic chemotherapy or peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. And poorly, if it is poorly differentiated, PRNT is not going to work. So systemic uh, chemotherapy with somatostatin analogs. So what is the place of PRRT? Now presently, uh, it is it is uh, it comes in the last line of therapy. Patient uh, surgery is the first. Then the uh, patient is treated by the conventional various uh, known modalities. And if the patient is progressed and they do not have any other option, then they, then PRRT, if the somatostatin receptor is positive on those, those tumors, then PRRT can be used. So we have yttrium dotatate 
and lutetium dotated uh, for this uh, two kind of molecules are there but most commonly lutetium dotated is used uh, it is used around 150 to 200 millicuri and we can give three to five cycles uh, the interval between the cycle is around six, six to 12 weeks So take home message is like PRT is a like uh, shows a high tumor response rate. It is around 80% response and uh, progression free survival reaches around 40 months according to Netter one. It is it is uh, it has a high safety profile and the side effects are very low. And MIBG, MIBG, the, it is a noradrenaline gonadotropin analog, and it is taken up by the cell by energy dependent type one amine uptake mechanism or passive diffusion. So, MIBG therapy is mainly uh, it is used in uh, pheochromocytoma, non resectable pheochromocytoma. Or metastatic inoperable pheochromocytoma, inoperable paraganglioma, or carcinoid, neuro, neuroblastoma, and various kinds of kind we can use uh, MIBG therapy. So, using uh, MIBG therapy during the because most of the uh, this neuronal tumors are secretory kind of tumors. So, while giving the therapy, the patient's uh, blood blood pressure can be uh, raised significantly so like uh, we have to monitor the patient and patient uh, uh, monitor the patient while giving the therapy and we use around 100 millicurie to 300 millicurie to treat the patient so what what we expect is uh, like decrease in tumor volume and response like a patient should become symptomatically better that is the most important part in neuroendocrine malignancy patient should become symptomatically better so liver tumors coming to liver tumors, uh, like there are challenge because uh, liver tumor, there are dual pathologies, there are tumor and cirrhosis, and there is a heterogeneity in the tumor, and plus uh, patient is having underlying cirrhosis, and uh, like transplantation is the best option, but it is difficult. So. What we use, we call in our is tear, tear or SIRT. Tear is uh, trans arterial radio embolization or SIRT, selective internal radio, radio, radio therapy. So it is similar to taste, like the process is similar to taste, but only there are my minor differences which I am going to highlight. Uh, the, our aim is to measure to cause the tumor necrosis, down, downsizing of tumor, and pre pre prepare the patient for surgery. So rational is to improve patient selection and improve the receptivity and improve curability by, by changing the immune micro environment of around the tumor cells. So before doing a uh, tear, so the, we have to first assess, assess how much is the shunt between hepatopulmonary shunt. And to assess hepatopulmonary shunt, we use technetium ma. So like if the shunt is more than 10%, then we cannot use tear so then taste is only option but in certain situations where there is a portal venous uh, there is thrombus in the portal way you cannot use taste so in those cases also you can use tear this is this is the advantage of tear so now we what we do is we do dosimetry there is a software software based dosimetry is done and we calculate how much radioisotope uh, is to be given through the arterial route. And the major role is of doing tear is of intervention radiologist. Nuclear medicine helps to uh, tell about the shunt and uh, to calculate a dose of radioisotope. So we use yttrium, like yttrium, there are two types of yttrium molecules, which are one is resin based, one is glass based, surspheres or therospheres. These are two, two kind of uh, molecules we have, which is which can be used in tear. So what is, uh, it is like effective. It can be used even if there is a portal venous uh, thrombosis is there, but only drawback it is, uh, the cost is very high. So 
So cost is a major disadvantage here. So in bone pain palliation, uh, we have various radionuclides which are beta emitter or the alpha emitter. Alpha we use radium-223 chloride and beta emitter in most commonly in India, it, uh, samarium-153 is used. So we see that uh, bone pain palliation radioisotopes they work mostly on, mostly on sclerotic lesions. So sclerotic lesions are mainly found in breast, breast and prostate cancers. And these two cancers have majority of uh, burden in the bone. So in those cancer, cancers, uh, if a uh, patient is having widespread metastasis and whole body radiation, like it is impossible to give. So in those, those patients and patients are not responding to opioids and we can take, we can think about giving uh, bone pain palliation by using radioisotopes. So these are the options we have NSAID or opioid dysfunctionate surgery, but radio, radio pharmaceuticals are usually an option in widespread metastasis. Uh, and if the, if the expected life expectancy is more than four months, in those cases, we can try giving uh, palliation through radioisotopes. So these are, I have already mentioned, these are the various kind of uh, uh, radioisotopes we use for bone pain palliation. Most commonly in India, 153 samarium is used, which is easily available and advantage is that after giving that we can scan the patient also. So another isotope which is used is uh, radium-223 chloride. So yes, LCMCA, LCMCA trial, uh, which is published in new NEJM, so this radium-223 chloride mechanism action is that it, it goes, goes to the osteoblastic cells, uh, which is surrounding the tumor cells. So the, it has a two, two goals for it. One is for pain palliation, like whether it, it, it palliates the pain. So it is seen that after giving radium-223 chloride, the use of opioid has, has been significantly reduced in the patient. We can see that. Uh, use of opioid and the quality of life as of the patient is increased. And it, it also have radium to it also have survival benefit. Yes, uh, overall survival, we can see that uh, compared to the placebo, it is 14.9 14 months median overall survival. So compared to 11.3 months. So it is some survival benefit with the uh, improvement of quality of life. Thank you. I think uh, I had uh, some problem with the moving of the slides, but I tried to cover most of the things. If I, if I if there are any questions, I will be happy to answer. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Sandeep. It was really a wonderful talk. So uh, I would like to uh, uh, request all the delegates, if they have any query, they can always put forward. Okay, I have one query. So regarding that neuroendocrine tumor, am I audible? Yes, yes. Hello. Yeah. Yes. So yes. in your, yeah, I I have two patients of cervical neuroendocrine tumors. So uh, I think uh, I was not knowing yet that this is also one of the treatment options. Basically, are you uh, telling me the MS recommending this in the recurrent setting or uh, in the primary setting? Sir, it is not in the primary setting. Recurrent primary, setting. Uh, in a recurrent. Or Okay, go ahead. Yes, sir. In a, in a recurrent setting where the patient has progressed on most of the standard therapies. So on the, in those case settings, we have to do and we have to first see whether the, it is, the tumor is uh, showing the receptor. Only if uh, receptor is positive in yeah. the image, then only we can treat with those, those kind of somatostatin receptor therapies. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So if there is no other query, I would, uh, would like to close the session. I would like to thank all the organizers, especially the office bearers of a &E, and also particularly to Bhuya sir. It is because of him today we are seeing this. It is his vision, a &E. So I was one of the founder member of a &E, So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Uh, 
Barman and uh, Dr. Nirmal mm -hmm. for chairing the session and to Dr. Sandeep and the other speakers. Uh, we'll move on to the next session, which will be uh, on uh, liver cancer. And this will, for to chair this session, we have Dr. Ashish Rai, who is the uh, consultant radiation oncologist at Sikkim. And uh, we have Dr. Todak Taba from uh, the Tomoriba Institute of Medical Sciences at Itanagar. So we welcome you. And uh, um, is Dr. Dilip Kumar uh, Parida there? Okay. Okay. I I think uh, Dr. Ashish and Dr. Taba can take it forward. Yeah. Good evening, uh, everyone. So we are moving to the session on uh, hepatocellular cancers. So in the very beginning, I would like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Vamshi Krishna, who is the consultant medical oncologist from AIG Hyderabad. So sir, if you could uh, please continue with your uh, uh, presentation, please. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you. Uh, thank you for the warm invitation from the army. Um, I feel bad that I'm sitting here in Hyderabad. I would have loved to be there and present somewhere in the live audience, but I guess that's not really possible now. So I hope my vo voice is audible. Uh, very much, Vamshi. Please go on. Thank thanks, Caleb. Yes, right. it's audible. Uh, my job today is going to be talking about the targeted therapy in HCC. And presently, where we are, is what is aptly summed up by Buzz Lightyear that we are aiming at infinity and beyond when it comes to HCC. Next slide, please. When you look at the BCLC staging and the categorization, something that we all well aware of, what we now know, uh, I would be only talking about the last part, that is the advanced HCC or the BCLC stage C that has extrahepatic spread or has uh, portal invasion. I'm not really going to cover anything about the chemoembolization and local tumors that has already been covered. I'll be talking about mainly that set of patients where the surgeon gives up and the intervention radiologists give up and finally it comes to us. Next slide. Traditionally, next slide. In this group of patients, we really did not have anything. For a long time, chemotherapy didn't work. Then it was kind of uh, oral multikinase inhibitor that was forafinib that came to us as the only systemic therapy that was proven to extend overall survival. Now, the benefit was modest. We had an overall survival improvement of around two to eight months compared with the placebo. Uh, for those who want the actual numbers, it's 10.7 versus 7.9. Uh, you know, the problem was the response. The response rate was only 2%. However, in the absence of anything better, Sorafenib kept on going for a while. There were several other trials which were done. You had sunitinib, you had brivotinib. You had some other kind of multi-tyrosine kinase inhibitors, all of which proved to be negative. Next slide. Now, when the sorafenib was checked, we had only two major trials, the phase three sharp trial. And later on, there was the Asia-Pacific study that was focused in Asia. Again, when we say Asia, Indians are not really included in this. It was mostly the Asian, Southeast Asian countries and Japan. Now, the interesting part is when you look at the eligibility, for the sharp, patients should have had advanced HCC, PS0 to 2, child cook A, without any prior systemic therapy. That's it. There was no other stratification required. For the Asia-Pacific study, patients were actually stratified with regard to uh, MDI and or extrahepatic spread. PS1 to 2 were allowed here. And in both the groups, look at the other arm. It's a placebo. So we essentially had a drug compared to placebo in a first-line setting. It's something which is pretty much unheard of in oncology as of today. Next slide. When we looked at these studies and the response, we found that the SHARP study had an overall survival, like I said, of 2.8 months, hazard ratio of 0.69. The Asia-Pacific study, again, did not even achieve that kind of OS, but around six and a half months. So not really encouraging or earth shattering. However, the only drug that seemed to work, and more importantly, the competitors, even though they were multi tyrosine kinase inhibitors, did not seem to work. One reason was, so far, and this holds true today also, we really do not have a single driver mutation driving all HCCs. It, it could be because of the various etiologies, it could be because of various reasons why HCC develops, but it's not like lung cancer, where you have a single EGFR mutation driving it. 
with the cancer being dependent on that mutation so that you could target it. That so far we have not seen in HCC. Next slide. So the next advance really came around when you try to look at combining sorafenib with local regional therapies. Again, plenty of such studies done, except the first one, which is the tactics that actually showed a, a sort of PFS advantage. Most other trials actually fail. So sorafenib alone, probably good enough. Any benefit when you try to push it to earlier lines or combine it with local regional therapies? No benefit. Next slide. That is when the other drug came that was lenvatinib. Now, lenvatinib is also a multi-tyrosine kinase inhibitor, but there is some slight difference as compared to sorafenib. The major difference is the coverage of the FGFR pathway, FGFR4, FGFR1, and the VEGF. Now, Sorafenib and Rivodafenib do inhibit the VEGF pathway. They have some effect on the ras ras kinase pathway, but this FGF pathway is uniquely inhibited by the Lenvat. So that could be a reason why it seems to work better than Sorafenib alone. Next slide. Now, the trial that was done was known as the REFLECT study. Next slide, please. Now, the REFLECT study Next slide, yeah. So the REFLECT study or study 304 was a randomized open label phase three non inferior study. Again, look at where we are headed. We are talking of placebo versus sorafenib. Now we are talking of lenvatinib versus sorafenib, but a non inferior study. Now, importantly, they used BCLC B, not applicable for taste or C, and child book A alone. Those patients who had more than 50% liver involvement. Clear bile duct invasion or portal vein invasion at the main portal vein. Now, these are patients who are not uncommon. These were all excluded from the study. So, essentially, you're trying to filter out the more uh, aggressive variants, the more advanced patients. PS was only 0 to 1. They combined looking at the body weight of less than 60 or more than 60. Lenvatinib versus sorafenib. Big numbers. That is one thing which was very impressive. They used almost 500 patients in each arm. The primary endpoint here was overall survival. Now remember, non-inferiority, overall survival. That's what was the uh, trial showing. Next slide. In this study, when they looked at the PFS, this was the initial results that we got. PFS showed a significant improvement with lenvatinib 7.4 versus 3.7. Next slide, please, Ravinder. And that had a hazard ratio of 0.66, very good PF, P value. But remember, the trial was actually not designed to look at the PFS. The primary endpoint was overall survival. Next slide. Now, this overall survival, when they looked at, there was no difference. Numerically, slightly better. Hazard ratio 0.92. But non-inferiority established and slightly better. Next slide. When they started looking at the subset analysis, now specific subsets like microscopic portal vein invasion, extrahepatic spread, those who had MPDH seemed to do slightly better. Those where the AFP was more than 200 seemed to do slightly better. Both other subgroups, there was improvement in terms of their pattern. But again, this was post hoc analysis. This was not a planned analysis and not really the study was designed for this. Next slide. So when again you look at this the reflect study, it was an open label study. Investigators, patients both knew what they were getting. It met the non-inferiority endpoint, did not show any superiority. It showed improvement for secondary endpoints. Now, for me, this study was very crucial because sorafenib is something we have all used and it's not easy. Let's be fair. In Indian patients, sorafenib is not as easily tolerated. You do not really manage to give your 400 milligram BD. Uh, it's not uncommon to see patients being started on 200 milligram once a day, which is like basically a homeopathic dose. But this lenvatinib definitely has less side effects as compared to sorafenib. More importantly, the weight-based dosing, when you have 8 mg or 12 mg, seems to be much better tolerated. So even though it excluded an important set of patients and did not really establish superiority, then Matinib is kind of a first line for a lot of us when we consider so, HGC that cannot be managed otherwise. 
So after this, the latest treatment that really has come about to make a big change has been the IM Brave 150. Now the IM Brave 150 is a phase three trial of Etizo and Bevacizumab versus Sorafenib. Again, remember Sorafenib is our established first line. Lenvatinib, convenience-wise and choice-wise, we use, but not as a trial basis. It is just non-inferior. So using Sorafenib is a pretty reasonable option. Here, they used Etizozulizumab and Bevacizumab. Now, Etizo was used at a dose of 1200 standard dose, Bev at 15 mg per kg, again, pretty much a standard dose, versus Sorafenib, again, a standard. They excluded patients with high risk of bleeding. That's because Bev is being used. 2 is 2 on randomization, co-primary endpoint of overall survival and progression-free survival. Next slide. This population was a bit selective because we excluded those patients who had a risk of bleeding. So patients with esophagogastric viruses, which were associated with high risk of death from bleeding, so they were excluded. Next slide, please. So those patients were excluded. You excluded patients who had a higher varicial bleeding event within six months. So just presence of viruses which have been uh, which have been treated, you could include them. But there also, there was always a risk of bleeding. History of hypertensive crisis or inadequately controlled hypertension, both were exclusion criteria. And again, in practice, a few of us have burnt our fingers. I have not done so far, luckily, but there have been people who have burnt their fingers because of bleeding when you use this combination. So you need to be a bit cautious when you're using this. Again, there were certain uh, subgroup analysis which showed that H hepatitis B was not really covered. There were certain other subgroups not really covered. Next slide. So when they looked at the characteristics, you had HBV of around 49%, HPV of around 21%, HBV more common than HCV, uh, not really the situation everywhere. Uh, almost all patients were childhood A and most were BCLC C. Next slide. So in this trial, Etizo Beb demonstrated a consistent OS benefit. However, this was not conclusive for BCLC-B and non-viral etiology, not uncommon group in India. So those two groups, you actually did not find an OS. Moreover, the OS benefit was there for around three to four months. However, looking at the kind of toxicity, the kind of uh, costing that you're going to achieve with Etizo and BEV, well, it's not a drug meant for everyone. That's how I would conclude. If you are able to give this, if the patient is good, Yes, definitely go for it. However, the rate of AE withdrawal is higher in this group, surprisingly, and it's not as easy to use as it looks. The other, the only reason why for me this combination is so interesting was the response. You have around 3% CR rates in this group, and you have around 20% response rate, which was not seen with Sarah. So for me, given a choice, yes, we would give it, but with all the caveats that I have just listed. Now, beyond this, what are the other studies? Now, for the first study, that is Duva plus Trevelumab is very interesting, this Himalaya study. 1,300 patients, for me, this is probably a group which is likely to work well. The other one is the Lenvatinib Pembrolizumab, the LEAP-02. This is really the combination of the future. We have just got data today that it is working for gastric cancer. We are seeing good results in endometrial. It's got good results in esophagus. Probably, I have my fingers crossed. I personally feel LEAP2 and the first one. These are two things which probably are going to make a difference in HCC. Next slide. So based on all this, where are we today? For a patient with a childhood A without any contraindication, my first choice would be atezopef, provided patient can afford it. Those who do not afford it, I would go with lenvatinib. Where it is B7, there, sorafenib continues to play a role, though for me, it is not a category one as of today. I would use the other two as my categories. Anything else we will be used? If completely ineligible, probably nivolumab is an option, but not really as a first line. So for me, these three are what I would be targeting. But the important thing is to remember is that we need to make sure that we do not have any local therapies still available. We need to exhaust those and then only come on to these systemic therapies. Next slide. What about second line? 
The first drug which really showed a benefit was the resource study, the regorafenib. Now, regorafenib, again, phase three, double-blind, placebo-controlled study, looking at efficacy of regorafenib in patients following uh, sorafenib. You included macrovascular invasion, included hexahepatic disease, included PS0 to 2, and had a stratification for AF. Next slide. With all these, you we got that the P median PFS was actually doubled in this group with an increase of PFS from 3 to 1.5. Numbers look small. It's probably a something that you think only one and a half months, but then this is a median. There are patients who continue to do slightly better. And in a scenario where you didn't have anything, this is a good option. It was the first systemic therapy to also show a OS benefit of close to three months. Again, when you're talking of 10 months and six months, it's not bad. Next slide. Now, at this point, what are the other medicines which you can still use in second line? Next slide, please. So, ramucirumab was used in the REACH2 study, used only for patients with AFP more than 400, again showed some benefit, but again, with this restriction and the ramucirumab problem and the bleeding issues, probably not a very good drug. It's there. Cabozantinib showed a benefit according to the celestial, not available in India. The other two which are available are nivolumab and Pembrolizumab. So next slide. Looking at the, all the immunotherapy. Nivolumab in checkmate 040, second line. Checkmate 459 in the first line, non-significant. Pembrolizumab, Keno 224 was second line, in, showed benefit. 240, statistically not. So first line, single agent, nivolumab, pembrolizumab, no. Second line, both of them, yes. This ASCO 2020, we had the combination of, again, durvalumab, temelilumab. Second line, interesting data, not yet fully approved. We have to wait for the final. So what about this checkmate 040? This was a nivolumab in advanced HCC, open label, non-comparative, expansion, and escalation trial. Next slide. They included patients initially with all doses 0.1 to 10, and in the expansion phase, 3 milligram per kilogram. Uh, 214 patients included sorafenib 9, sorafenib experience. It was a single arm study, not a placebo control, single arm study. Next slide. They included patients who were child score less than 7 or less than 6. Progression on one prior systemic therapy. ACLT was normal, bilirubin less than 3. The overall survival here was around... Uh, 16.7 months in non-infected and overall overall survival was in 16.7. So very impressive numbers. We saw what regorafenib did in comparison to sorafenib. You were having around 10 months. So cross-trial comparisons are always difficult. But 16 months overall survival is certainly something that we would be happy. Next slide. So all this means that in second line options in NCC and at least, this is just one of them. You can use all the guidelines. They're more or less similar. You would put Suraf nivolumab as probably category one as one of the options if you have not used the IO in the first line. Other options include regorafenib, cabo we do not have, ramu only if it is AFP more than 400. Uh, lenvatinib, second line, not really very fond of. Pembro, as of now, is category 2B. It's probably going to be removed very soon. So we don't really need to look at that. So next slide. Overall, these are exciting times in HCC. First line, without any contraindications, patient affordable, I would go with atezobev. If not atezobev, due to whatever reason, lenvatinib, my preference, sorafenib, acceptable. Second line, if no IO in the first line, then nivolumab. Otherwise, you have regorafenib, cabozantinib, ramosurumab, or using all the other drugs. Of course, we do have tumor agnostic agents. Pembrolizumab can be used in MSI high or in EMB high, but frankly, that number is less. Most importantly, you do not have a driver mutation and one single drug available in HCC. Next slide. So thank you very much. And I hope I was able to shed some light on this. And I hope I stuck to my time. Thank you very much. Over to the organizers. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Vamshi, uh, for a wonderful presentation. Now, if anybody has any questions, they're most uh, welcome to ask Dr. Vamshi. If not, then uh, I'll hand over the mic to Dr. Todak. Dr. Todak, please do the honors. Thank you, sir. 
sir, I feel like uh, uh, running a lot of schedule. So I want to introduce, I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Supriya Chopra Sastri from TMH Mumbai. She'll be talking on role of radiotherapy in ACC. Dr. Supriya, please. Thank you for the kind introduction and thank you, Vamsi, for such a nice overview on um, chemotherapy for HCC. So my job in the next 15 to 20 minutes is to speak about the role of stereotactic radiation, which is a local therapy for hepatocellular cancer. And just to give everyone a very broad overview, HCC is fifth most common cancer worldwide, but very common in some parts of India, also in other parts because of, because of HPSAG and HCV. And there is also an incidence which is associated with NASH, but upfront in our country, uh, less than 20% patients are amenable for surgical resection or transplant at time of presentation. So for a vast majority of patients, taste remains the standard of care for large disease when patients have no or focal vascular invasion or metastasis. And Dr. Vamsi has covered about all the new drugs, but until recently, serafinib uh, was one of the few drugs that were tested and were approved for use uh, with a modest survival benefit. So when we go to local therapies of HCC, so you can see that most of the original trials that were done were against best supportive care and TACE became standard of care following a single randomized trial. You can see Lovett's trial in 2002 and it was positioned against best supportive care and hence for BCLC class B unresectable HCC it's considered the standard treatment. And already sharp trial has been spoken about, but the comparable arm was placebo. So after a lot of frustrating years for HCC, in the last couple of years, there have been these two or three therapies which are available, but clearly the outcomes are less than a year, at least with sorafenib alone. And when you look into TACE, in select series, it's going up to now 36 to 48 months, but it is based on case selection and a vast majority of patients would live less than 15 to 18 months. So if you look into BCLC staging, and today I've been asked to talk about the role of radiation. So in the standard guidelines until recently, radiation was not positioned as a therapeutic option. And you can see for small tumors, when patient has less than two centimeter tumor or three nodules up to less than three centimeter, there are a plethora of options ranging between surgery, TACE, RFA, or transplant. And for intermediate stage, it's TACE and advanced stage, there is sorafenib and now more chemotherapy agents. And traditionally, radiotherapy was not included because of high risk of radiation-induced liver disease using conventional treatments. But early on, uh, I would say in early 2000, there is a lot of interesting data that started emerging with the use of a new technique, which was called a stereotactic radiation. And you can see that what was very beautifully demonstrated was that if you could use these focal techniques of radiation, you could give very high dose of radiation to small volumes of liver and get very reasonable tumor control in the range of 80 to 90%, which was previously unheard of while maintaining complication rates of less than 5%. And there is how you can see in less than a decade, almost a decade ago, there were first publications of risk adapted liver stereotaxy, mainly coming from University of Michigan and Princess Margaret Hospital, which kind of, uh, I would say they were comparable to surgical principles that if you can save a good volume of liver, you can get away with doing liver stereotaxy. And what you see in these graphs is that if you have a small volume tumor, you can give very high doses of radiation. And if the volume of tumor increases, you have to get the prescription down and every patient is treated in an adaptive way and with a different prescription, unlike many other tumors from head to toe where you have a uniform prescription, because here the success also depends on the background organ. So these are the outcomes following stereotaxy RT alone in BCLC class A, 
which means small tumors less than five centimeter in size, essentially coming from medically inoperable patients. And you can see in these series, there are around 200 to 250 patients treated in the entire world literature. And you can see that local control of these tumors ranges from 77 to 95%, and with a five-year OS of 58 to 68%, where you are seeing a higher mm -hmm. OS Many of these are transplant series that stereotaxy has been positioned before transplant. So these are again the series. So this is a very North American way of treating um, HCC because there in stroke taste, people prefer to give stereotactic radiation. And here you can see in few of the series that wherever neoadjuvant stereotaxy has been positioned, uh, the local control is around 100% at five years. And you can see that series have a follow-up from 44 to 62 months. And what was very interesting is that one thirds of the pathological samples had complete response. Again, um, reconfirming the response. And these are the outcomes in BCLCB. When I see BCLCB means tumor, which is more than five centimeter and upper limit can be any much, whatever the size, provided you are sparing normal liver parenchyma. And here you can see again survival going close to two years. So this is very different than TACE and very different than sorafenib or any of the new drugs which are available for this class of patients. And once you look into how these large tumors respond to stereotaxy, so these are the survival outcomes with various doses of radiation. And to make things simple for the multidisciplinary forum, what I can say is that if you are able to deliver higher doses of radiation, the chances of survival are much better. And when you move on to larger tumors, which are more than 10 centimeter in size, it makes sense to combine with other treatments because you're not going to be in a range of more than 70 to 80% local control. So these are the outcomes. You can see there are at least four or five series where tumor size of eight to 12 centimeters have been included, where patients have had taste, followed by stereotactic radiation. And again, these patients who are technically seemed palliative, you can see that their overall survival, where stereotaxy is added to TAE or taste, the overall survival is reaching 36 to 42 months. And there is a clear rationale to investigate this further. So in 2015, there was a meta-analysis of taste alone versus taste plus RT. And very clearly the combination was deemed to be superior. And when SPRT was compared to tear uh, yttrium radioembolization, there was no difference in outcomes. And given the huge cost difference between tear and stereotaxy, whenever possible, SBRT should be the preferred alternative approach. So more recently, beginning 2020, NCCN has incorporated SBRT for class A as well as class B and C. And you can see that even in the absence of a formal randomized trial because of the excellent phase two data, it is already a category 2B recommendation in most of the uh, uh, guidelines. So what are the optimal candidates for SBRT? I've spoken about BCLC class A, B and C, but very much like surgical literature, we try to save at least more 100, 700 cc of normal liver. rule out many of the causes which can lead to liver decompensation. And much like surgical literature, we look into various criteria which put patient at risk of liver decompensation and go ahead with planning radiation using the stereotactic approach using generally a triphasic CT. And here you can see how various phases are used to delineate the tumor. And as I've said earlier, we use individualized adaptive prescription. So in TMH, we've been treating since 2012 and 13 with stereotactic radiation. So most of the tumors that we get have tumor size of around 10 or 11 centimeters who are not deemed suitable for any other treatment, going from nine to 15 centimeter and median volume around 184 cc. We try to use standard published recommendations, which I'll not go into detail in interest of time. And we use a very technical workflow, which is also published by our group of how we execute this particular treatment. And so, so what we 
try to do is we try to avoid any concurrent sorafenib because on sorafenib alone, patients have a lot of toxicity. And if you combine sorafenib with SPRT, chances of liver decompensation are very high. So we put patients off sorafenib two weeks before and after. So these are our results. We have treated around now, by now around 40 patients with 53 lesions. And a vast majority of our patients are HCC and a less number are metastasis. And you can see most of these patients had failed previous lines of therapy, either residual lesion after taste, post-surgical relapse, post-RFA relapse. And this is typically how we treat these patients. It's the largest tumor. And we try to focus a very high dose centrally and a relatively less dose peripherally. And patient finishes treatment within seven to eight days. And these are our outcomes. You can look into the uh, volumes of tumor. They are pretty large by any standards. And if you look into the outcomes that have been published uh, uh, by our department, so these are the outcomes published by our surgical colleagues from Tata, where median T size is nine centimeter and three year OS is around 62 to 37 centimeter. And in this cohort, if you look into DFS, patients who did not have pre taste had DFS around 21 months. And if you look into the stereotaxy cohort, if there is a patient of child A5, we are reaching 21 months. But mind you, these are not comparable cohorts. The patients who come to us are those who are seemed unfit for surgery. So you can see that with appropriate use of technology, even in unresectable tumors, you can have very good outcomes. So this is how our TMC series compares in the range of 10 centimeter tumors. We have a one year survival of around 61% with a grade three toxicity of around 20%, which is very comparable with the literature. And right now we are running a phase two randomized study of taste versus taste plus SVRT, which is supposed to recruit 67 patients. We are at 38 patients recruited. And there is another trial run by IAEA, which is taste plus SVRT for unsectable and table HCC. And that trial is currently recruiting. This is a summary of many other ongoing trials. So I would like to conclude by saying that uh, uh, in future, we are hoping to have more evidence on stereotaxy and possibly it will move in a more robust way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam, uh, for <laughs> enlightening us on the role of radiotherapy in HCC. Uh, and more importantly, thank you so much for finishing in time. <laughs> thank you so much. Caleb, so now, Caleb messaged me, so I had to listen to him. Actually, uh, we, the next speaker is not available. I, I don't think he's joining. He has had somebody sick in the family. Dr. Anirudh Kulkarni is not joining. So we do have some time. I I, I, I think we can invite uh, Vamshi. Vamshi, are you still there? Vamshi? Yeah, we can uh, have some uh, we can have some extended discussion. Yeah, uh, actually, Dr. Supriya, uh, I just wanted to know in your SBRT thing if uh, there is a portal vein portal vein thrombosis or any vasculature is compromised, do you still go ahead with the SBRT or uh, what is the protocol? So, actually, these are the patients where we definitely typically patients with portal vein thrombosis. Um, is not as possible. So if patient has a terminal thrombus, intervention radiologist can do a super selective taste, but their outcomes are not very great. And uh, so if you end up giving them sorafenib alone, then they don't survive for as long. So median survival, if you are able to use stereotaxy, is around 10 to 12 months uh, with SBRT. Having said that, some patients do much better than the others. So for example, uh, in our experience, there is at least a 15 to 20% partial recanalization rate. So we start with mm -hmm. radiotherapy and on follow up scans, if there is recanalization, there are a couple of patients where we have later done taste after recanalization has been done. And some of yes. them have actually, you know, gone to become three or four year survivors. But having said that, in my experience and in experience of many other people in the world, HCC is actually a very radio sensitive tumor. So even with not very high doses of radiation, um, the local control rate is uh, quite something. And many times you see patients actually dying because of background liver disease rather oh, than the HCC. 
So, uh, so was the SBRT uh, directed towards the thrombus or towards the tumor? Like, you know, what the recanalization no. that you're talking about? So we do everything. So we treat tumor plus thrombus. So I know many That's people right. have been talking about treating only thrombus. But what do you do if thrombus doesn't recanalize? Then you are in a mess because yeah. you have not treated the tumor. So we always treat tumor plus thrombus and expect that there will be less than 20% chance of recanalization. I know of some series from China and I've personally interacted with them. They use a more protracted fractionation for portal vein thrombosis. They feel that recanalization rate is much higher if you reduce the dose per fraction, but they've not published their data as of now. So, but so, uh, but if you include the tumor and the thrombus, won't your treatment volumes be very large? You said the minimum uh, yes. you have to leave around 700 cc. Yes. So in these patients, we end up, these are two or three kind of patients. So if there is patients who have terminal thrombus involvement, their outcomes are, you know, relatively much better than the central thrombus involvement of portal vein or going to IVC. So the lowest dose that we have used is 25 in 5 or 27.5 in 5. So this is exactly what I'm saying. That many, many patients are controlled even with this low dose. It is not published anywhere, but I would like to say that much like HPV-related oropharyngeal cancer, maybe hepatitis B-related uh, liver cancer is probably more sensitive to radiation. We don't know. So these patients, uh, HPV-positive and 27.5 in 5, we've seen very sustained controls for two to three years also in patients. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, I remember that uh, earlier you used to do intrabiliary radiotherapy. Yes. And other things. That was, so, has that, the, with the advent of SBRT, has, have you stopped uh, uh, other things, your EBRT, or is there a role for uh, other forms of radiotherapy? So, endobiliary brachytherapy, we use more for cholangiocarcinoma, not for HCC. So, it is used in two contexts. So, one is for palliation. So, typically, these patients come with cholangiocarcinoma with very high bed open, invariably they will have to have uh, uh, drains put in place. Uh, so when the intervention radiologists are putting the drain, we can put catheters for brachytherapy. And once the drainage has been done, we used to go ahead with brachytherapy more as palliation. And patients later on who would not show metastasis on a PET scan, then supplement with ER. So brachytherapy was used more as a palliative tool or to boost external radiation for cholangio CA. Okay. Ma'am, uh, and uh, I don't, you, you said that you were getting, uh, the surgeons were sending to you the cases which, which are the bad ones. Right? Of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> So, say if you get a patient who is a BCL, I mean, uh, who is, has a child score of a child score C, mm -hmm. but whose performance status is quite good, yeah, do you still consider for a, a treatment, and what is your take? I will consider only if liver transplant is envisaged for this because you know if it is BCL C A and child C, that means that patient needs a liver transplant, right? That's the ideal treatment. So basically. If I try to put radiotherapy on top of it, chances of his decompensation is very high. So it has to be done with a very good hepatic team and with liver transplant team. So such patients, I know many private hospitals are treating such patients, but most of the private hospitals which are treating these patients have a tie up with the transplant group. So many of these patients end up undergoing, I know at least Medanta and Dr. Uh, in South in Chennai, Dr. Uh, Rela's team. Yeah, they try to use, in Tata, we don't have a tie-up with the transplant team. So, uh, or patients that we see cannot afford transplant. So, child C, BCLCA, when you're using stereotaxy, you have to be prepared of it as a bridge to transplant. Are there any questions from other uh, delegates? Okay, then good luck. Yeah, uh, if there are no thank more you. questions, then thank you. Thanks, thank to, the, uh, thanks to uh, uh, Dr. Supriya for the uh, wonderful talk and the interactions. And to Dr. Ashish and Dr. Taba for uh, sharing the session. Thank you, sir. We'll, uh, thank you, Caleb.
which would be a quiz. I request uh, the, uh, the event manager to put up the questions. So we, you will be given this is uh, this quiz is for everybody to participate in, but then the prizes will be only for the uh, uh, residents and the trainees. Consultants won't get prizes. Um, so uh, please click uh, type in these. Um, the the this link in your uh, browser, and then we'll start off with the questions. I'll just give a couple of minutes for everybody to type in. Also, I have uh, typed this link in the chat box. You can also uh, copy paste that link also. So I guess there are. Uh, quite less number of residents around. So in that case, uh, Vikas might choose to give uh, prizes to the consultants also. I don't know. Vikas will take a call once he's back. So I think it's good if everybody participates. There are only 20 questions. And it's, it's quite interesting. Is, uh, is everyone ready? Oh, no. wait, 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 wait. Okay, okay. 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 You can just copy paste also. Go to the chat box and copy paste. Is everyone ready? Aftab, ready? So we'll uh, start with the questions. So uh, can we have the questions on screen, please? Your, your time starts now. We'll have 20 minutes, uh, maybe 20 minutes or uh, 10 questions, 20 questions. So we'll have 15 minutes for everyone. So within 15 minutes, you have to send in your questions. After that, we'll start going through the uh, the answers. So we will go another round through the same questions, the same slides. At that time, we will uh, uh, look at the answers. Okay. So the first question is, uh, this, there is the residents and who, everyone who's participating, please uh, Type in your answers and uh, into the form, which is which comes up when you open the link. So the first question is in neuro fibromatosis type one, that is uh, von Recklinghausen's disease. It's most commonly associated with what type of intracranial tumor? The options are meningioma, astrocytoma, glioblastoma, and oligodendroglioma. I repeat. Astrocytoma. After you're not oh, supposed oh, to we do that. You have to only oh, type, in, type in. Okay, okay, okay. So negative marking for you, after fine for <laughs> you. So uh, I repeat, uh, neurofibromatosis type one, that is von Recklinghausen's disease, is most commonly associated with what type of intracranial tumor? The options are meningioma, astrocytoma, glioblastoma, and oligodendroglioma. So please type in your answers in the form there. Next slide, please. What other question number two? What other tumor can be seen in children that have bilateral retinoblastomas? The options are pineocytoma, pituitary adenoma, pineoblastoma, anaplastic ependymoma. The question number two is what other tumor can be seen in children that have bilateral retinoblastomas? 
pineocytoma, pituitary adenoma, pineoblastoma, and anaplastic ependymoma. I think it's something like the third eye, I think, which we talk about. Yeah, we move on to the next question. What is the most common variant of basal cell carcinoma? The options are nodular, superficial, morphiaform, and infiltrative. What is the most common variant of basal cell carcinoma? Nodular, superficial, morphia form and infiltrative. Next slide, please. Which of the following is associated with an improved outcome in oropharyngeal cancer? E16 mutation, lack of EBV viral load, PS53 mutation, HPV infection. Which of the following is associated with improved outcome in oropharyngeal cancer? P16 mutation, lack of EBV viral load, P53 mutation, HPV infection. Next question, please. A patient presents with shock-like sensation in the extremities with neck flexion four months after receiving head and neck radiation. What is the most likely cause of his symptoms? Options are brachial plexopathy, Lehermite syndrome, sciatica, bullion bar syndrome. A patient presents with shock-like sensation in the extremities with flexion four months after receiving head and neck radiation. What is the most likely cause of his symptoms? Brachial plexopathy, Lehermite syndrome, sciatica, and bullet bar syndrome. Next, yeah. What level in the mediastinum are prevascular lymph nodes? Two, three, four, five. Yeah, which level in the mediastinum are prevascular nodes? Two, three, four, and five. The options. Next. So, which trial initially established 60 gray as the standard dose for unresectable, locally advanced, non, non small cell lung cancer? Which trial initially established 60 gray as a standard dose for unresectable, locally advanced, non small cell lung cancer? RTOG 73. 7301, RTOG 8311, RTOG 8808, and RTOG 9410. I think this is a biased question because Vikas is a radiator, uh, radiation oncologist, he's including such trials. Next question What is the most common type, uh, type of tumor in the anterior mediastinum? Thymic carcinoma, thymoma, non seminomatous germ cell tumor, and thymic carcinoid tumor. What is the most common tumor in the anterior mediastinum? Thymic carcinoma, thymoma, non seminomatous germ cell tumor, thymic carcinoid tumor. Next question. All of the following are risk factors for the development of uh, breast cancer, except Age, nulliparity, family history, age at last pregnancy. Remember, this is an all except question. Which of the following are all of the following are risk factors for the breast uh, development of breast cancer except? So, age, nulliparity, family history, and age at last pregnancy. Next question. Which of the molecular subtype descriptions is incorrect? Luminal A, ERPR positive, HER2 negative. Luminal B, ERPR positive, HER2 positive. 
basal like erp are negative her to positive basal like erp are negative her to negative so you have to identify the incorrect molecular subtype yeah next question is what percentage of breast cancers are associated with the germline mutation 5% 10% 15% and 20% next question which of the following is not a risk factor for the development of esophageal cancer plummer vincent plummer vincent syndrome tobacco and alcohol tylosis and h pylori infection again remember this uh, it, it's a negative question it's not a risk factor so plummer vincent syndrome tobacco and alcohol tylosis and h pylori infection yeah next question what was the pathological complete response rate in those that underwent neoadjuvant chemo radio radiation in the cross trial what was the pathological complete response rate in those that underwent neoadjuvant chemo radiation in the cross trial 5% 20% 30% and 35% your next question please in which subset of the stomach is gastric cancer least commonly found antrum lesser curvature greater curvature and cardia again in which subset of the stomach is gastric cancer least commonly found antrum lesser curvature of the body greater curvature cardia yeah next question please extending radially outwards from the lumen of the rectum the correct order of tissue layers is lamina propria submucosa muscularis propria serosa lamina propria muscularis propria submucosa serosa serosa lamina propria submucosa muscularis propria and muscularis propria serosa lamina propria submucosa so here the expected answer is the correct sequence starting from the lumen outwards yeah patients with familial adenomatous polyposis contain a mutation of which tissue suppressor gene patients with fap which is the gene which is mutated P fifty three, APC, FAP, and VHL. Next question. The targets of Tempsil, Tempsirolimus, and Sunitinib are respectively PDGFR and EGFR, EGFR and PDGFR, mTOR and PDGFR, PDGFR and mTOR. please remember the sequence of tempsirolimus is first and sunitinib is next what is the half life of psa 0.9 1.6 2.2 .2 and 4.3 days yeah schuller dual polys are seen in which type of testicular tumor Choria carcinoma, endodermal sinus tumor, mixed GCT, and seminoma. Schuller double bodies are found in which type of testicular tumor? Choria carcinoma, endodermal sinus tumors, mixed germ cell tumors, and seminoma. And last question: All of the following are risk factors for endometrial cancer, except obesity, multiparity, late menopause. prior use of tamoxifen please remember it's an all except question all of the following are risk factors for endometrial cancer except i think we are done with the questions um, we'll uh, just give a couple of minutes
is everyone done with it if anybody needs more time please raise your hand or you can unmute and tell also yeah uh, sunidhi how many responses you've got sir eight till now nine till now okay we'll just wait for a couple of minutes sure sir meanwhile i invite uh, dr uh, apurva kalita to announce the results sir dr kalita yes yes yeah sir uh, uh, you can say a few words and then you can start with the oral uh, the uh, results of the oral presentation yeah yeah good evening everybody so i hope that there's been a very rich deliberation and discussions and i thank dr sila and dr jagtap for organizing in such a nice way the virtual 16 annual conference of the association of oncologists of northeast india i thank you all <clears throat> and now i'm going to announce the results of the oral paper presentations the first prize goes to pallavi kalbande and the second yeah uh, uh, what is pallavi there yeah pallavi is it is she there okay she is from varda varda medical college okay okay she is not there okay then the second prize goes to abdul wahid dar okay abdul mm. was abdul jammu yeah, yes sir Yeah, yeah, very good. Congratulations. Very good. Why don't you, uh, why don't you show your uh, video? Thank you, thank you very much, sir. Okay. Okay. And the uh, third prize goes to Janubi Das. Okay. Uh, She's from. Okay, Janubi Das is from uh, I think uh, State Cancer Institute, if I remember. That's very good. Yeah. So. So congratulations to all uh, all of you. Uh, please send your email IDs and contact number to the or the uh, ANI Oncology at gmail dot com email ID or to Dr. Vikas's email ID if you have. Uh, I mean maybe uh, please allow a couple of weeks. Uh, after that, your uh, prizes will be given to you. That will be decided once Dr. Vikas is back. The same will be given to you. Congratulations again. So just congratulations to all the winners i am very happy that uh, this time in the 16th annual meeting our participants have been from all over the country and the prizes are won by students from different parts of india as well as from the northeast it's a very good thing uh, for the organization and i hope the in future next and subsequent meetings also will have participations from these type of centers from across the country yes so sir it was a very good thing to happen sir uh, we have one winner from uh, varda you say varda the second the second place is from, from jammu kashmir from kashmir yeah. and the third is from guwahati so we are very happy they were very happy i should be very happy everybody should be happy ani is now known across the country and is a platform for people from across the country um sir kalita sir i have sent you the uh, results of the quiz by whatsapp please uh, check in and also okay
sir or i'll send it by uh, i'll send it by uh, chat in this got it got it okay okay sir. Okay, the the results of the quiz competition. The so first, third place, on, third place onwards, third place onwards, sir. Yes, please. <laughs> Go reverse from third okay. to second okay. to first. Okay, 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 okay. Mm. okay. That sure, will sure. be more interesting. Yeah. Sure. The third prize goes to Gita Sri Bora. Okay, fine. She was a BBC student and now in a state cancer hospital, Guwahati, yeah. I think. Why don't you uh, um, switch on your video? You can unmute yourself. Show up your face, Vita Sri. Let us see how you look like now. I saw you three years back, I think. Yeah, she is. Uh, she's Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Right now, yeah. I am outside, so I just okay. can't see. Oh, okay, fine. Congratulations. Congrats. Okay, thank you. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Okay. Then the second prize goes to Nitish Kumar. Okay, oh, it's from. Please, please unmute you yourself. You show up and identify yourself with a uh, video. Uh. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, good evening, sir. Yeah. Hello. Uh, good. Thank please, you, sir. Please yourself. Sir, I am from uh, Maulana Jad Medical College, New Delhi, sir. I am PG3, sir, resident. That's very good. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Nice. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. And, and then... The first prize goes to Dr. Uh, Janmanjai Mandal. Janmanjai Mandal. Okay. Janmanjai, please, please, Mandal. Yourself. Your uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Thank, you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, you are from? I am from Medical College, Kolkata. And third year junior resident. Very good. Uh, very, college, good. Kolkata, very good. Very good. Congratulations. Congratulations. Hmm? So I'll just add up uh, the, the marks which they, they have scored. The first prize, uh, Dr. Janmanjai Mandal has scored 19 out of 20. Dr. Nishri Kumar has scored 18 out of 20. And mm. Dr. Drita Shri Bora has uh, scored 17 out of 20. Again, we have a winner from Delhi, we have a winner from Kolkata, and we have a winner from Guwahati. So we are really yeah. happy. Congratulations. Very happy. Yeah. yeah. So, Thank you, thank you, Kalita. Thank sir. you very much. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you. Uh, our secretary will contact you all, okay, and send certificates as well as if there is any prize uh, in this quiz. Sir, right? sir, we have we do have a prize, sir. Uh, mostly it will be a cash prize. So, okay. doctor, uh, please. Uh, yes. Yeah. After because comes back. And phone numbers to the uh, ANA oncology uh, at gmail .com, That email ID, or if you have doctor Vikas Chaktap's uh, ID, you can send it, please. So we uh, we will contact you. Maybe please allow a couple of weeks once Dr. Vikas is back uh, from home. We will uh, do need for Congratulations once again to all the winners. And uh, uh, before we go for the vote of thanks, I would like uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Buya, our president, to give some concluding remarks. Uh, I must say that uh, <clears throat> although we did in this platform. I think it has, it has been a fantastic conference since yesterday. Participation is good. Over the net, I have been observing around 30, 35, 40 participants are already, always there in this loop. And all were definitely you know, listening to the deliberations, participating, talking, and even in competitions, you have seen a pan-India competition this time. Uh, I'm very happy, I'm sure. All the members of AONI must be happy that our organization catches the eye of people across the country. It has grown. It will grow. And we'll have a next conference next year. So with these few words only, I'd like to conclude nothing much. I thank all the people who have participated. It's because of the participants that a conference becomes successful. It's not because of the organizers that a conference becomes successful. But all the responsibilities are of the conference organizers and they work a lot, work very hard. Here, Dr. Vikas and Dr. Kaleb had been the main people sitting at, uh, they are in the same institution to 
uh, they had worked very hard, but unfortunately at the end moment, Picasso had to leave uh, for his father's ailment. Uh, Kalev has shouldered all the responsibility and he has fantastically managed. He has been here with us, with the group from the beginning, yesterday till now to the end of the conference. I thank you, Kalev, very much. And we, we want, I want that all, everybody should have this much of belongingness and participation in the future programs of AONEI. Thank you all. So we'll have to thank formally. Yeah, I'll, so call I'll up the, answer. yeah, vote of thanks. Call up the vote of thanks. Yeah, uh, so uh, I would like to thank uh, all, all the participants first especially the residents. Actually, uh, the, such a conference is organized mainly for the residents. So we uh, especially thank all of you and all the participants in the, both the quiz and the presentation, uh, oral presentations. I wish to thank all the uh, uh, speakers, the chairpersons and other faculty members who have uh, participated. So uh, despite all the hiccups with the uh, online conduct because of uh, lack of uh, bandwidth and other problems, I thank you all for participating. And uh, I wish to thank Dr. Vikas. Actually, he's not here, but he, has, he had put in a lot of effort and uh, it, uh, it wouldn't have been possible to contact without uh, all the efforts, background efforts, which was done. And I also wish to thank the, uh, the event managing team, uh, Mr. Uh, Ravindra Puro Purohit of the Mighty Duo. The company is called Mighty Duo. So I think Ravindra is uh, the one person who was here and the other person is Sunidhi Kohli. Thank you, both of you and others in your team. And uh, we also wish to thank uh, everybody else concerned. And we have to thank God for uh, giving us this, this. Everything went on smoothly. Thank, thank everyone for it. Thank you so much. Good thank night. you all. Good night. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful conference. Hope to see you next Thank year. Thank you all. And Thank then we all. have to do better next. Thank you.